nursing services, personal care, and related services were forced to enter institutions to access those services. So for a state to um, adopt a waiver programs, they must demonstrate that providing these services won't cost more than providing them in an institution, ensure the protection of people's health and welfare, provide adequate and responsible, reasonable provider standards to meet the needs of the target population, ensure the services follow an individualized person-centered service plan. In Kansas, we currently have seven home and community-based waiver programs. We have an autism waiver, frail and elderly, intellectual and developmental disabilities waiver, physical disability waiver, serious emotional disturbance waiver, technology assisted waiver, and a brain injury waiver. So I'll just give you a little overview of the intellectual and developmental disability waiver. The IDD waiver was established in 1991 and delivers community-based services to individuals aged five and older who have a developmental disability, meet the de definition of an intellectual disability, and who are eligible for care in an intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Services are designed to help individuals with IDD maintain their physical and mental health in their home and community. To be eligible for the IDD waiver in Kansas, an individual must meet the following criteria. Must be five years of age or older, have a diagnosis of intellectual disability made by a licensed healthcare professional before the age of 18, have a diagnosis of developmental disability made by, oh, excuse me, must be determined program eligible by the Community Developmental Disability Organization, must meet Medicaid long-term <laughs> care thresholds, be financially eligible for Medicaid. So there is a single point of entry for the HCBS IDD waiver program in Kansas, the CDDO, determines eligibility and will work with the participant and or their, their family to access services from a variety of community service providers. The services offered on the IDD waiver allow part participants to live in the community as independently as possible in single residence or group home settings. Examples of services include personal care services help with bathing, toileting, laundry, lighthouse keeping, and health-related care. Other services include day programs, medical alert device rental, financial management services, sleep support, supported employment, and wellness monitoring. So we will go on, move on to how do we uh, develop what is an IDD waiver rate. Rates refer to the payment amount set by the state that is paid to the provider for delivering specific types of care to individuals with IDD in their home and community. Labor is often a significant portion of, but not the only cost to the provider. Each service has a specific rate associated with it. These rates vary depending on the type and intensity of the service the qualifications of the provider, and other factors. In Kansas, Medicaid service, services are delivered through a managed care health delivery system called CanCare. KDHE, as a single state Medicaid agency, contracts with three managed care organizations. We have Aetna Better Health of Kansas, Sunflower Health Plan, and United Healthcare. The state pays the MCOs a per member per month capitation payment. MCOs contract with service providers and pay directly to the, for the utilization of services. In managed care, the state establishes a rate schedule that identifies the floor rate. The Medicaid floor rates are the minimum that is required to 
of the MCOs to pay each service provider. Kansas Medicaid also has other flexibilities for MCOs regarding other payment models, <clears throat> which include the following, value-based payment agreements, single case agreements in lieu of services. So how are these rates billed? After a provider has contracted with a beneficiary's MCO, the MCO care coordinator develops the plan of care or person-centered service plan, identifying the services the beneficiary is authorized to receive for the provider. Once services are rendered, the provider will submit a claim directly to the MCO. The claim includes a specific code for the service, the time spent providing the service, and or any information that may be required. MCOs review the claims and pay the provider based on the agreed upon rate per the contract between the MCO and the provider. So how are these rates, how and when are new rates determined? How are they increased? HCBS rates can be determined based on several different factors including cost rate studies, stakeholder engagement and feedback, provider network adequacy. Ultimately, any new rates or rate increases are subject to legislat le legislative appropriation. So on uh, slide 12, you will see the current IDD service rates for FY24. They are um, dealt out in units. Each service has a unit definition um, and a rate that is paid. We have overnight respite, personal care services self-directed, sleep cycle support, or what's now called enhanced care service, specialized medical care for nursing, personal care services agency directed, supported employment, medical alert rental, financial management services, wellness monitoring. So we're, um, so we also, the two major services that are provided under the IDD waiver are the residential and the day service rates. These are um, determined by tiers Day and residential services have a rate based on the tier, which is related to different, different levels of care. This is determined through the assessment uh, called the basis, which is done annually for every person on the IDD waiver. So if you look at the next slide, um, this just gives you an IDD rate history. Since 2017 up until 2023, the rates have increased. Um, the last rate increase was for FY 2023, which was a 25% rate increase. Um, so on the next slide, it just shows the residential regular tier rates and the super tier rates. and those have steadily increased over the last several years, as well as the day service rates, which um, are on to slide 16 from the regular and the super tier rates. So slide 17, K KDADS is required to complete a biennial, biennial rate study as put forth by the Developmental Disabilities Reform Act. KDADS is preparing to complete the next biennial rate study. The last rate study was not done due to COVID-19. The last completed rate study was completed in 2016. So we received a proviso this year from the legislature and the expenditures shall be made by the above agencies for some monies during fiscal year 2024 for the purpose of reviewing the overall
costs of providing services with the intellectual and developmental disabilities service system and making recommendations to the legislature for a method to make regular rate adjustments for such services based on inflationary indexes. KDADS plans to contract with a consultant to provide the state and legislature a biennial rate study. The contractor will also be asked to review the overall costs of providing services within the intellectual and developmental disability service system with recommendations for future inflationary adjustments for consideration. KDADS is preparing to solicit a contractor to assist with a study in the near future. At this time, I can take some questions. Thank you, Michelle. Committee, do we have questions for Michelle? Yes, Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Michelle, thanks for the, the uh, presentation. Sure. Um, you know, on, on uh, slide five, the waiver overview, um, when it says uh, be financially eligible for Medicaid, could you just expand on what that income level is? So for, so for the waiver, um, when we look at individuals for a waiver, we only look at their income, even if they live with family members who may have a greater income. Um, the income level has, the um, protected income level has risen over the last few years. Um, I think it's about 2300 a, a month for that. And so that would be the individual, not the family? Pardon me? That would be the... IDD individual, not yes. the family. Yes. So, um, I mean, this is an assumption, but then that actually makes a lot of people more eligible than they might be otherwise if you're just look, if you're looking at total family income. Yes, that's a correct. More people are eligible that way because their family's income isn't ta taken into consideration. They would only look at the person with the, the, the disability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Fagg. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, when you started your first part of your presentation and you had a breakdown of each of the community-based waiver programs, do you have any numbers of the actually people in each of those programs? Um, I, I do. I, I don't have that with me, but overall it's about 25,000 people we serve in Kansas on our waivers. Okay. So it would be interesting to see in which areas in each one of these. Right. Uh, On the IDD waiver, we serve over 9,000 with okay. a waiting list of about 5,000. Okay. One more. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> when you get to page five, you get into the eligibility part, and you talk about must be five years of age, and then the next statement says have a diagnosis of, uh, of intellectual disability made by a licensed daycare before the age of 18. When do we actually decide when there's a problem? You know, do, do we catch it young enough? What does your agency do to make sure that these people are doing their job? That would be my question to you. As far as um, the diagnosis? Right. We've talked about money here. How do we know that our money's being spent to take care of this? What, what does the agency do? So the to agency does administer the program, the IDD waiver program. Right. We ha work with our 27 CDDOs throughout the state, community developmental disability organizations, okay. who serve as the point of contact throughout the state. If, some, if a family comes to them with someone in their family saying, I think they need support, they help them to gather documentation to see if they may qualify for waiver services based on having an intellectual disability okay, or so developmental disability. So you feel good about the way that we handle the kids at a very young age then? I, I think that we, we do a really good job of overall of identifying those individuals. Not everybody comes to the CDDO that has a child with those needs. We know there are many people out there that elect not to do that. They handle that within their own families. Um, but we, you know, we see people as young as five and much older that are coming to ask for assistance. Um, sometimes this happens when a family becomes, the parents become elderly and they need they realize they're going to need help in supporting their son or daughter on a waiver and then they come to the CDDO and the CDDO looks for information to see 
if they um, meet the criteria for, for uh, the waiver. They look at school records, doctor's records, um, identifying that the person has an intellectual or developmental disability. Thank you. Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple, uh, two, maybe two or three quick questions, if I may. Uh, if you'll turn to page 17 on your slide deck, mm -hmm. uh, it appears that we're statutorily compelled, or KDADS is statutorily compelled to complete this biennial rate study. And then it jumps down here and says the last one was 2016. Mm -hmm. Is that a misprint? No, that's correct. Uh, oh. We didn't do one uh, due to COVID in, uh, when we were um, in 2019. What about 2000? Oh, is it, is it on uh, even years? I mean, would it have been 2016, 2018, 2020, 22, and now coming on 24? Is that how it's done every two years or? Yeah, approximately. Okay, so then can you tell me what happened to 2018? That was not a COVID year. I, I cannot tell you what happened at that time. We don't have, a, we don't have information on that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Representative Haswood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I see that we have a couple more slides left about the wait list. Is that going to be another presenter today? Um, I'm going to use those slides to introduce another pre presenter. Okay. Yes. Cool. I think some of the concerns might be addressed with um, people receiving services from diagnoses, and that wait list of what I'm hearing is years. Yes. Um, when yes. I look at the uh, uh, rates, um, how often are these rates covering 100% of the services that people need? And like, um, how much do people go into debt and their families go into um, health care debt? I, I can't answer that question specifically. What I can answer is that when someone is on a waiver, um, that the person-centered service plan is supposed to cover all the needs of that person um, within the within the realm of the waiver. I can't answer though it, how many families go into debt. I imagine there are some that do that, but once they're on the waiver, they they have a medical card, so their medical needs are covered, as well as their uh, waiver needs should should be met as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Mason took my first question uh, okay. away, uh, why we didn't, if, obviously 218, 2018 was ahead of COVID, so I'm curious about that. But the other thing I just might want to add to um, Senator Fagg's deal is that even if they're identified at this point in time, even if they're identified as needing those services, it's a 10-year wait list. So the CDOs can identify those folks, you know, that they do need services. Then they go on the wait list of 5,000 people. Ten years later, they may get those services, except for in crisis exceptions. So anyway, thank you. Representative Bueller. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> So I'm looking at, I think it's slide four that shows the seven home and in the com community-based waiver program. So there's seven. Correct. So two things, and one, I, is there some place I can go to get more information on what defines each of these seven? But really the second part of it is, and I'm just asking for an opinion, do these seven uh, completely encompass all individuals who would have an IDD or is there, are there, other buckets, and I, I don't want to open Pandora's box, but are there other buckets, in your opinion, that maybe one or two that should be added to this to this list? And again, I'm asking just for um, if if the size of the pool is 25,000 Kansas are, Kansans, are there one or two other buckets that would open this up even greater? So th that's a really good question. These are waivers specific to certain disabilities. Okay. The IDD waiver is just one of them and where we serve about 9,000 individuals currently. Uh, the other waivers serve uh, people that meet criteria for the autism waiver, the frail and elderly, the brain injury, the 
physical disability and the SCD or se uh, severely emotionally disturbed waiver, disturbance waiver. Um, I'm glad you asked about opening it up. We are gonna be working towards getting a community support waiver to hopefully um, be able to serve more Kansans with an intellectual and developmental disability because the wait list is so long. Um, so we're in the process of working on that. Um, it will take time because the application with uh, CMS takes year and a half to two years to complete. And then we have to work towards um, uh, building a provider network and we have funds in our FMAP money to do that. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, CMS to approve that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Committee, other questions? I have a question for you, Michelle, on this, and that is we, in, in my talking with Kansans who have relatives that are on the waiting list, they say, well, now they're receiving the other Medicaid services, but not the therapy. Could you address that? Um, therapy as far as okay. I don't know this is just what I've been told is that they even though they're on the waiver mm -hmm. they are still receiving some Medicaid services so I'm just trying to find out what services are they receiving and what services are they waiting for could you address that I will try okay. um, we have two waivers that have therapies on it and that's the brain injury waiver and there's no waiting list and the severely emotionally disturbanced waiver, and that has no waiting list as well. If you have a medical card, you can avail yourself of all the services um, that you uh, might need. Actually, as I'm standing here, I'm thinking they may be talking about the autism waiver, um, which has therapies on the state plan, the um, applied behavioral analysis um, services that are very uh, needed for children with autism. Um, you do not have to be on a waiver to receive those services, but through the through the state, but you would have to have a medical card. So what I'm trying to determine is what services are they currently receiving, even though they're on the waiver, and what services are they not receiving because they're on the waiver? If you're maybe you're not the best person to answer that, but if you if you could address that, we would appreciate it. Um, they should be. If they're on a waiver, they should they should be able to receive all services on the waiver, as well as all services through their medical card. And but those, I'm not really sure where and those where you're who are going. waiting, those who uh -huh. are on the waiting list, mm -hmm. are they? You said they have a medical card. Are they? So they have the their medical card, right. their Medicaid card. Right. But then, what services are they waiting for? Because they're not on the waiver. They're waiting for the services that only provided on the waiver for the IDD waiver. So I did show you in the slides what those some of those services are, such as day, residential, personal care services, um, FMS services, medical rental, overnight care, overnight respite. Those are the services that they're waiting for because those aren't on the regular state plan. Thank you very much. Committee, other questions? Senator Fagg. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I was wondering, do you look at other states as to programs that they have? Uh, is there any state out there that you think does a good job with, with this type of need? Uh, I'm just wondering, because it's kind of important to look at the whole picture and see who's doing what on this. So. Right, so I will be talking about our plans for the community support waiver a little bit later. Okay. And we did look at Missouri and some other states to look at the kinds of services they have on their community support waiver, which helped them to lower their waiting lists for services. So why did you pick Missouri? Um, a comparable state, they're, they're next door. Um, they're, they're, um, this was recommended to us by a number of stakeholders to look at Missouri because they have a model we can build from. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Petty. Thank you, Michelle. Have you been looking at Missouri since they passed Medicaid expansion? Have you been looking at Missouri since they passed Medicaid expansion? Um, I don't know when they passed Medicaid expansion. Two years ago. Um, yes, we did. Uh, we we looked at it um, last year, so 
Yes, we did. Which frees up other money, so. I believe it does. Thank you. Yes. Committee, other questions? Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. And then we'll go on into then the waiver study. Correct. Right, I will have just have, the I just have two slides I'm going to go over before okay. I turn it over to Dr. Evan Dean with okay. KUCDD. Right. Um, if you look at slide 21, you'll see the intellectual and developmental disability waiver waiting list, which is currently at about 5,000. Um, the green line that you see there was the underserved list, which we were able to get rid of uh, in 2014 with the advent of CanCare. Um, so the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities, KUCDD, is a contractor for the waiting list study. Um, the first aim is the collection, compilation, and analysis of existing data, uh, data gathering and analysis to inform data-driven decision-making about planning to effectively and efficiently serve people on the waiting lists leading to a better outcomes for Kansans with IDD and their communities. Aim two of this project, collection and analysis of current and future support needs. Data analysis, analysis, analyze the current and future service needs of individuals on the IDD waiting list. Methodology development, development um, develop a methodology to identify individuals at risk for crises, track and trend data to inform decisions regarding system capacity building and reducing the waiting lists for services, and report, submit a detailed report including goals, outcomes, and recommendations regarding services. Our timeline for this project is September 2022 through approximately August 2024. And with this, I'm going to introduce Dr. Evan Evan Dean, who ha is going to give us some preliminary findings they have made on the waiting list study. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Dean. Hi. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and committee members. Um, thank you, Commissioner uh, Hayden, also, for in inviting me to talk with you all today. Um, so as the commissioner said, I'm here to give an uh, update on the study that we're currently partnering with, with KDADS to, um, to implement. Um, I'm just making sure the slides are started. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'll say that um, I'm with, uh, I'm an associate director at the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities. Um, and so we're partnering with, with KDADS on this study. We are also partnering um, with other centers at the University of Kansas, um, including uh, Gene Hall's team at the Institute for Health and Disability Policy Studies and Carrie Wendell Hummel at the Center for Aging and Disability Options, as well as Shay Tannis, um, who's a national expert um, and also affiliated with KUCDD, uh, who runs the State of the States projects that looks at um, expenditures and service options um, across the country for um, services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So before I jump into the study, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on KUCDD. We're one of 67 uh, university centers for excellence uh, on developmental disabilities. Um, and so we are um, mandated as part of the DD Act to uh, provide leadership um, and advise federal, state, and community policymakers uh, about um, and promote opportunities for individuals with developmental disabilities to exercise self-determination, be independent and productive and integrated and included in all facets of community life. So we are actually one of three entities um, in Kansas and every state uh, has uh, the, the same entities uh, that are considered, that, that make up the DD network. So the USED is one at the university along with the uh, Developmental Disabilities Council and the Protection and Ad Advocacy Organization, which is the Disability Rights Center in Kansas. And KUCDD in particular um, has a four core functions um, that are related to research, um, training and technical assistance, 
uh, and information dissemination. So um, this project um, and uh, training also uh, future service providers. Um, so um, this project uh, meets a lot of those core functions. So we're excited um, to be a part of this project. So related to our project in particular, as uh, Commissioner Hayden said, the goal of the project is to really inform KDAD's decision making regarding the system capacity for reducing the, the, the waiting list. And we're doing that in a couple of different ways. One is that we're collecting and analyzing existing waiting list data. Um, and in just a second, I will uh, share some of the preliminary results from the data that we've received and analyzed to, to this point. Um, and then second, we are collecting information through a survey on the needed supports of people that are currently on the waiting list. Um, all of this is to in inform uh, the decision making. The other uh, component to this is that we are, uh, and I'll, I'll share um, our process here too, is that we're engaging other states that also have waiting lists to understand their uh, processes for um, man managing their waiting list and reducing waiting lists. So I'll talk about each, each of these aims uh, in, in, in particular. So aim one is around collecting and, and analyzing current data. And um, the purpose of this aim, uh, we're trying to do two things. One is to understand the overall makeup and the experiences of people that are currently on the waiting list. Um, also related to um, uh, the crisis exceptions uh, and how people enter services. And then to uh, create a predictive model of service needs so that we can uh, begin to understand um, over the next five years who might be entering services um, through a crisis exception so we can begin to plan for that. So the... Um, I'll talk a little bit now about the uh, data that we've, um, oh, so uh, our uh, project timeline, um, as uh, the commissioner said, it's, uh, we're uh, roughly about 12 months into a two-year process. So uh, we still have a little ways to go. Um, as I've uh, ta talked about uh, the, the last time I talked with the special committee, um, Research uh, like, like this is, uh, is I, I compare it to like building a road, that there's a lot of foundational work that kind of hap happens in, in the beginning that you don't necessarily see, uh, but is happening. So a lot of the work that's been going on this year has been collecting the data that, that we're going to analyze and developing our procedures, understanding that data. Um, so uh, we are excited to have some uh, results to share. Um, and, uh, and I'll uh, share those uh, with you now. There's still more, more to come on this. Uh, so uh, a, a couple of things to note. Uh, one is that the data that we've been analyzing we received on December 6th of 2022. So some of these numbers will, will look different than the current numbers that we have. But at that time, there were 4,831 people on the waiting list. Uh, with an average wait time currently uh, of five years. So uh, average uh, people have been on that waiting list for five years. With the maximum time, so um, in, in your packets, I think this might have been adjusted, but we added decimals in there. <laughs> so it's actually 10 and a half years um, that, that, uh, that the, is the longest that, that people have, have currently been waiting. We rounded up here, and, uh, uh, but so one, wanted to correct that. So we're also, so that's the intellectual and developmental disability waiver. We're also analyzing data for the physical disabilities waiver, which is the other waiver in Kansas that has a waiting list. So um, in the same time frame, there are 2,000, roughly 2,300 people on that waiting list with an average uh, wait time of one year now. And the maximum time on that one of, uh, it's actually just under about uh, 2.5 years uh, on, on that waiver. <coughs> so then uh, if we can go on to the next slide. So uh, we analyzed the, um, the birth year of people on the waiting list to try to uh, begin to understand when people are, are joining the waiting list. So as you'll see, the, the graph on the left shows um, there's, it, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a blue line uh, around the year uh, 2024 um, that, that is roughly the age of, of 18. 
uh, from, uh, when, from when we started in 2022. So the people to the right of that line um, are people that are under 18 that are on the waiting list. So you'll see that a lot of people are beginning to join uh, before the age of 18, so they're still receiving services in school um, and other places. Uh, and then um, the, the remaining people are uh, joining the list after, 20, um, after they turn 18. The physical disabilities waiver provides much di a, a different type of services to a different population. So there, um, most people are, are actually joining um, uh, as, as they age, which is when most people uh, need those services. So I uh, just wanted to uh, show a little bit about, about when people are, are joining the list. So if we go on to the next slide. Some of the other data that, that we've been looking at are the reasons that people have been removed from the waiting list. Um, and so this data is uh, uh, over a five-year span, uh, and all this data is going to be we're going to be using uh, to create our, our predictive model at, as we go on. So you can see roughly um, uh, about half the people. Uh, this is the intellectual and developmental disabilities waiver that we'll talk about first. Um, are are removed from the list by receiving services. So that's great. <laughs> we, we want people to be doing that. Um, and, then, and then you can see the other reasons that, that people have um, been removed from, from the waiting list. Um, uh, about 13% have been uh, unable to uh, locate or contact. Um, some have been on the, uh, an incorrect waiting list, and that's been adjusted. Some people have moved out of state. A few pe uh, about 5% have voluntarily been removed from the waiting list. Um, you can go on and, and, and see the other ones. Um, on the physical disabilities waiver, um, some similar pre uh, percentages there. Um, about 52% are placed in, in, into services that are on the waiting list. About 17% have been... Um, unable to, find, to locate or contact. 8% um, of the people um, were uh, deceased before they received services. 7% um, were placed in um, nursing facilities. Um, and then you can go on and uh, see the other ones there. So the next data I'm, I'm going to show you is from, we have two years of data on why people entered services through a crisis exception. Um, so, so these are people who were on the waiting list and had, um, for d different reasons, entered services because of a, a crisis. Um, so we have five years of data showing uh, the number of people who entered into crisis exceptions. One thing I want to point out here is in the number is much lower in 2022, and that's because we, we only have data through uh, May of that year. Uh, so that's only representing about half of, of that year. But so then in 2021 and 2022, we, um, uh, KDADS uh, began tracking the, the reasons that, that people um, entered services. So we have analyzed that data. Uh, it was descriptive data that we, that we had to go in and um, kind of uh, code and, and create and understand the, the reasons for that. But so then the, the table on the right shows the reasons that uh, the main reasons that we uh, listed the top 10 reasons here that people enter into services through a, a crisis exception on the IDD waiver. So the, the main reason is uh, related to caregiver needs. So this could be um, a medical or financial reasons uh, that um, a, a caregiver is no longer able to support the person that they're caring for. Uh, and, and so services are needed. Um, the, the next, um, Two really relate to um, um, and extensive behavioral supports that, that a person might need, um, some of which in, in had uh, criminal justice involvement. Um, and then the, the, the next highest one is related to abuse, neglect, and, and exploitation. Uh, as I'll talk about in a little bit in our um, learning from other states, this is similar uh, a, a similar breakdown to um, reasons in other states that um, that people um, enter services through crisis. So for the physical disabilities waiver, which is the next one, the, um, the reasons here are, um, are different uh, based on the, um, the reasons for entering into crisis um, 
uh, situations. And the, the main reason that, that people enter services through the physical disabilities waiver is an imminent risk for uh, being placed in a nursing facility, which is one of the main purposes of that physical disabilities waiver is to pre pre prevent that. Um, uh, and, and then uh, you can see others um, have, have entered uh, from acquiring a terminal illness. Um, and then um, the, the rest are related to adult pr protective services involvement. So that's the data that we, we've currently analyzed. Um, we, we have uh, other data that we're looking at um, related to eligibility data um, and uh, the, the scores that people have had um, to uh, qualify for services and also um, claims data through, through Medicaid that, that we're currently analyzing. So AIM-2 is really about uh, developing a survey to better understand the, the supports that people need on the waiting list. Uh, and so we're, um, we're using what we've learned in uh, analyzing the existing data to, uh, to, to uh, develop that survey so that we can uh, forecast the service and support needs over the next five years to better understand the, the supports that people are going to need when they enter services. Because people have been on the waiting list for a long time, five to 10 years, and people's supports change during that time. So we want to understand currently what are the, what are the needs that, that people have so that, uh, that we can inform KDADS to be sure that those needs are going to be met. So if we can go on to the next slide. Um, this is again just showing our timeline. Currently, we are um, we've almost completed drafting the the survey that we're going to send out, and I'll talk a little bit about the process that we've used to to develop that, which has included a lot of stakeholder gathering, a lot of stakeholder input, uh, and and testing the survey. So the plan is for the next five or six months to um, once the survey is ready to be collecting data on uh, around 2,500 people on on the waiting list. It's about 20 percent. So to develop the survey, we used um, we wanted. We want to be sure that uh, that the survey is scientifically valid that, that we're putting out there too, so that we can trust the results that are coming in. So uh, this is the uh, just wanted to highlight a little bit of the process that we're using to develop that survey. Um, we did a national search for existing tools on uh, that measure the support need of of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and one of the things we've done is actually created two surveys. Our initial plan was to create one, but we created two based on feedback that we've gotten from uh, uh, family members and people that are on the waiting list and, and KDADS and other people that, that we've been talking to. And so I'll talk a little bit about the differences in these surveys, but really we, as much as we can, we wanna be sure that we're receiving information from pe the people that are actually on the waiting list. Um, but then we also understand that there are times, especially given that uh, primary reason that people are entering services through um, the needs of uh, caregivers changing, we also want to be sure that we're talking to caregivers and understanding information from their perspective, uh, especially related to um, the financial burden of um, caring for someone on the waiting list and just changes in their health status and life situation that may cause someone to uh, enter services through a crisis exception. So these surveys, um, we've been working closely with uh, the Self-Advocate Coalition of Kansas um, and other people that are on, uh, people that are, so people that are on um, the IDD and the physical disability waiver. Uh, we've been talking to family members and, and other stakeholders uh, to review the, um, the questions that we're asking to be sure that both the questions make sense uh, and that are uh, really uh, covering the things that, uh, that we need to be uh, covering. We've also formed a steering committee uh, made up of um, members from, uh, from the CDDOs, for the members from uh, Centers for Independent Living, as well as family members um, and self-advocates uh, that are um, going to review the survey once it's completed to, to get uh, more stakeholder input to be sure that we're getting the information that's going to be useful to, uh, to the people of Kansas. 
Um, so if we could go back to that previous slide for just a second, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the different surveys that we're developing. One is the, the uh, service and support survey. So this is the survey that's intended to go out to uh, the people that are on the waiting list to really understand the services and supports that people currently need. So there's three sections uh, for this. One is around service planning, so thinking about the things that they want to be doing in their life, um, you know, working, where they want to live, what, what they want to be doing with their life. And the second one is really about uh, support planning, so really thinking about the intensity of support that the person needs uh, to do the things uh, that, that they uh, want and need to be doing in their life. And then finally, a little bit about uh, the demographics also. Then the caregiver survey, which is the second survey that, that we've started uh, developing, um, which we, we actually modeled this off of a, a survey that was created by the Health and Human Services, um, and th that has five domains, uh, six domains, sorry. Um, one is related to the caregiving responsibility, so to understand um, how many people are providing support to the person that, that's on the waiting list um, and the uh, amount of time and the types of support that people are providing. Um, then the second one is related to the needs of the, uh, needs of the caregiver and, and the person to kind of understand the extent of the su support that's provided. Um, and also uh, as a way to kind of in, inform the, um, the new uh, waiver development to understand the supports and services that people need that caregivers um, feel that, that the person needs. Um, and then uh, related to the, the financial and employment impact of caring for someone on the waiting list, we're going to ask questions ab about, um, you know, the amount that people are spending to, to support people on the, um, on the waiting list and also the employment impact. Have people had to re reduce or uh, reduce their um, employment or, uh, or not work to care for the person that's on the waiting list? And finally, to understand the goals of the, of the, the caregiver's goals for the person uh, for the future. So if we can go on to the next slide then. So these Surveying people can, can, can be tricky <laughs> uh, because there's going to be people that are going to need a lot of support to answer some of the questions uh, that we're asking. But as much as we can, we want to be sure that we're, we're getting information from the person that's on the waiting list. So what, um, what our current plan is to do is to, for people that are 14 and above, um, we're going to uh, ask, uh, sorry, for people under the age of 14, we're going to ask the caregiver to complete both of those surveys on, on the person's behalf. Um, recognize that, that, that people under 14 um, may not um, have, have really thought through the supports that they need and, uh, and, uh, and understand that. And the, uh, so we'll ask the caregiver that's providing a lot of those. For people over the age of 14, we're, we're going to, um, as much as we can, um, ask the, the person that's actually on the waiting list to complete those surveys, recognizing that people are going to need a lot of support, and we're going to ask about the type of support that people need. There'll be some people where the caregiver will still need to complete that survey on the person's behalf, um, but there, and there are times where the, the person may need someone to read the survey to them or help them think through the different answers. Um, and there'll be some people that can complete it completely on their own. So uh, we'll, we'll ask questions to be able to understand uh, the types of support that, that people need for that. The physical disability is um, uh, the, um, I said, you know, the, the nature of people that are on the physical disability waiver are, are different. Um, there were so few people on the physical disabilities waiver that were under 16 that uh, we decided to only um, administer that survey to people o over 16. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're going to ask the person that's on the waiting list to complete the service and support needs survey. And then um, the caregiver, not everyone on the physical disabilities waiver will have a primary caregiver that's providing support right now. Um, but as much as we can, we, we will ask, the, ask them to identify a caregiver to complete that other survey. Um, our plan for uh, sampling, too, I should say, is we're going, going to randomly sample people from across the state uh, to, to complete the survey. With the, uh, 
but we're all, we're going to randomly sample within the different regions of, of the state so that we can begin to understand the differences um, and, and be sure that we're understanding the perspective of, of people of, across the state. So finally, I just have a, a little bit of information uh, related to what we're learning for, as we've talked to other states. So we're uh, approaching this in, in a couple of different ways. One is that we, uh, we um, send a survey to, um, to other states that, that have a waiting list. We identified those states through the Kaufman Family Foundation, um, sorry, Kaiser Family Foundation, <laughs> um, who tracks um, waiting lists uh, across the country. Um, and we found 35 states that currently have uh, a waiting list. So we've asked them to complete a survey. We've also asked them to, uh, to uh, join focus groups um, to uh, talk more in depth about how they're uh, managing their waiting lists. Those um, focus groups are still ongoing. So uh, I'm not gonna talk a, a whole lot about our findings from those because we haven't talked to all the states. But currently, we've uh, 15 states have responded to our survey, including Alaska, Colorado, sorry, and, and th these are divided up here. Um, so 35 states that have um, waiting lists for intellectual and developmental disability services. Of those, 15 states have responded, including Alaska, Colorado, Georgia, Iowa, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, Nebraska, so you can see um, uh, states from, from, from around um, the country. For the physical disabilities waiver, 21 state, we identified 21 states that, um, or 20, sorry, we've identified 21 states that have current or recent waiting lists. Um, and of those, 10 states have, have responded to our survey um, from, from across the, the country. Alabama, California, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, Nevada, Utah, and West Virginia. So for uh, so a little bit of, about what we're learning, the average wait time um, across. Um, sorry, I'm just catching myself up on my slides here. <laughs> um, so of the uh, of the states that we've talked to. Um, 16 of those states have had um, waiting, um, waiting lists for their IDD waivers. The average um, size of the waiting list ranged from 1,700 to a little over 8,000. And the average length of time that people have waited have ranged from one year to 10 years. For the physical disabilities waiver, the wait list size ranged from one to about 8,000 with the average wait time from uh, about one and a half months to 22 years. Most of were in the one to three year range, which is similar to Kansas. Most states um, have managed their waiting lists on a first come first serve basis with the exceptions for crisis um, or priority need. Um, and as I, as I said earlier, the most common reason for uh, crisis exceptions were related to um, caregiver um, risks, abuse, neglect, exploitation, high-risk behaviors, and criminal justice involvement. Uh, some states have uh, been successful in using a standardized assessment tool to help determine the crisis and priority need. Um, and so we're going to be taking a, a look at some, we already looked at some of those tools to inform the survey that we're developing and we'll continue to look as we learn more about the tools that states are using. So if we can go on to the next slide then. Um, so some states also do offer services to people that are on the waiting list. Um, including um, state plans for long-term supports, uh, services and supports, such as personal care, um, nursing support, and case management. Uh, and uh, these uh, services are usually capped for people that are on the waiting list. Some states use the state general fund or county-funded services uh, to fund services such as respite, um, caregiver compensation, family support payments um, that are also usually capped. Um, uh, and then um, some states also contract with entities to help educate people uh, and connect them to community resources that can support them while they're on the waiting list. 
There's a few uh, states there that um, had waiting lists when we contacted uh, for, based on the um, Kaiser Family Foundation information that have um, uh, eliminated their waiting list um, or working towards uh, eliminating their waiting list. Um, so that um, happy now to pause and answer any questions um, that the committee has. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Doctor, for being here. Sure. Um, so on your slide here that um, talks about the waiting list, 4,800 people, uh, five years. Mm -hmm. So how do you arrive at the five-year average time? We've always heard 10 years. I'm trying to get to the bottom of that to understand. You know, also in that, are crisis ex exception folks figured into that figure? Yeah, so so what, what we did was took the, um, uh, look, looked at the date that people joined the waiting list um, and then the, uh, the date that uh, people left the waiting list with the, um, or, uh, or the current date uh, of 2022. So a lot of people ha have joined within the last, uh, uh, you know, five years or so. So uh, a lot of those people are still on the waiting list. So it's um, the longest people have been waiting is about 10 and a half years, but there are a lot of people that joined more recently. Um, and so the, the average that people have been waiting so far is five years. But you, you really don't know how long those people that just joined in the last five years will wait. We'll wait. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm just saying it's, it's kind yeah. of, okay. So just, let's just be clear about that is it, they still may, they've joined within the last five years, but they still may wait another five years for a total of 10. Yeah, you're correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Ballard. I don't know if you can yeah. Yes. Yes. Representative Ballard, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I just cannot get visual. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have two questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. This morning. Um, of the survey, uh, Doctor, when you were looking at it, especially the one on caregivers, I, I think we know how important the caregiver is uh, to the person they're taking care of. We offer any services to the caregiver, even though their person is not on the waiting list. Representative Ballard, I'm sorry, the that was kind of skipping in and out, and we turned you up a little bit. Could you repeat the question? Okay. The, the doctor talked about the survey on caregivers, and I know how important caregivers are to the person they're taking care of. My question is, do we offer any service to the caregiver now, even though the person they're taking care of is not on the waiting list. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's still on, they're not on the list, but do, do, will the caregiver get any kind of service at all now? Uh, that's a great question, and, and I would uh, defer to Kate Ed's on that. Um, but my understanding is that people that are on the waiting list do receive case management services. Um, and then uh, a lot of the people that are on the waiting list are still in school um, re receiving services through school. But I would defer to Kate Adds if there's anything else to add there. Okay. We had a head shake, meaning no, um, no Representative Ballard. There are not services currently for the caregivers, for the, the um, people that are on the waiting list. Thanks. Thanks. And I'll follow up with a question that Representative Carpenter had. We, I'm looking at your time frame that you indicate that people can be on the list from one year to 10 years. Well, obviously, maybe the 10 years is referring to cancer. But I guess my, what is the average wait time, though? That's what I did not hear, that among the states, since you're surveyed 35, What's the average wait time that most states have for people? I mean, 10 years is unreasonable, especially when you talk about people die while they're still waiting on the list. Uh, 
I agree. Sorry, I'm, I'm just flipping, flipping back through my notes here. Um, So the, um, the average wait time uh, for people on the intellectual and developmental disabilities waivers that, that we've learned from through our survey of other states is a, around, uh, the rough average is around six years, but that varies from uh, anywhere from a year to 10 years, depending on the state. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dean. Having sat at the inter in the interim last year, uh, not knowing anything about the waiting list, this is great to hear these numbers okay. come out, so I do appreciate this. Um, it's instructive that fully half the people who come off the IDD wait list come off because of crisis. So, uh, of course, that shoves other people further back and extends their wait time. So uh, I, I th that may be something we have to uh, address. Uh, but on the PD wait list, a second point, uh, you only have a one-year wait list. Is that because there's sort of not that crisis group jumping the line, or are there more services on that on the PD side versus IDD side? And maybe that's for KDADs to answer. But I would uh, defer to KDADs on that. I did want to clarify one point that that if you're if you're looking at the the table here about reasons that people have been uh, removed from the waiting list. Um, that 50% refers to just people that have entered into, into, into services, not necessarily through a crisis exception. Um, so that's just people that, that have entered into services over the last five years. So I did just want to clarify that point. But your uh, initial results from AIM-1 uh, yearly crisis exceptions, that totals over, uh, almost 1,000 people, 978 people. I don't know what slide number that is. 978 uh, crisis exceptions over that five years. Mm -hmm. And the number placed on the services waiver was 1,920. Mm -hmm. So yeah. half of the people went from crisis. Right, okay. And maybe yeah. that's where we need to manage people better uh, so that doesn't occur. Thank you. Yep, yep. thank you. <coughs> Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a few questions. I was just wondering um, on um, the initial result for AIM-1, looking at the PD yearly crisis exceptions, there was an extreme high jump there um, in, from 19 to 20 and then 21 and 22. Do you, as you were looking at the, uh, the information, do you have any a justification for that? Uh, I would uh, need to defer to, to KDADS on that. But it's something we can look into. But It's looking at the PD yearly crisis exceptions. And then for the crisis exceptions, there's a huge jump from 19 to 20, 21 to 22. I mean, maybe it's COVID related. I don't know. But it goes from 27. It was like 12 and in 17, 16 and 18, 27 and 19, and then a huge jump in 20 to 217 and continues to be large jumps for 20, 21 and 22. Thank you. Um, and, um, so I, I, on the slide that had the um, bar graphs um, concerning the age groups, um, it, and I think you, you did go into this, but so when we have a prior, to, as long as we have eight, um, as we have um, participants who are um, in school, they're receiving services. And then that, so our, does it appear that our crisis times then are our biggest needs for, um, but during the time that they're in school, are they on still on the waiting list, even though they may be getting services through their school participation? 
Yeah, so they, they can still be on the waiting list um, and can be uh, receiving services. I'd say that uh, they're receiving educational services, uh, which, which are different from the services received uh, from, the, from the waiver. Different or just expanded for what they would get with the waiver? Well, they're uh, receiving services through the school for educational purposes. So um, they're also getting, I mean, um, so uh, someone with a disability or IDD, actually, they're also getting um, uh, caregiver services because they, nobody, I mean, the school district has, is having to cover that period of time that school services. So that would take up that need as well, wouldn't it? During the school day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, yeah, but uh, those... Um, they're educationally related, but, right. yeah. but their personal care is being covered as well. Uh, in the school, yeah. Uh -huh. So um, when we look at this graph, you're, you're just saying that there's that large gap once they, 20, once they age out. That, that could, could be that jump that occurs once they age out of school, of school age services. Yeah, so once they age out of school-related services, then there are uh, very few services that, that they're actually receiving. I mean, is so. that 21? What's that? Is that 21? Uh, it can be for some students. Um, that uh, 18 to 21 year um, range is, is optional for, for students, but some do still receive services in that age range. So, so, that, so then that uh, reasons for waiting list removal, that, that, does that include than anyone that's under 18? Uh, yes, that includes everybody that's on the waiting list. Okay, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Haswood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so is the survey implementation being sent out to everyone on the IDD wait list and is it through email or phone? Um, that's a great question. It's being uh, we're, we're sending out to about twenty percent of the sam of the people that that are on the the waiting list, um, just because of, of time and and financial constraints that we we needed to to limit that. We are initially going to send it out over email, uh, but we will be following up with people by phone, um, and we can also mail out the survey. Also, is it available in other languages? Uh, yes, we're going to translate it to Spanish. Okay. And is your study going to look at the um, overall financial, how much does the Kansas legislature uh, put in their budget to fund the IDD to address the wait list problem? Um, is that study going to look at the, the number and how much that number is recommended to the legislature um, that is needed to fund to, um, I guess, if there was a magic number that we could... Uh, allocate funding towards to um, get everybody off the wait list. Um, so we're, we're, we're not a, a addressing the, the financial pieces directly. Um, one of our partners on this study, though, is um, Shay Tannis with the State of the States Project that does look at expenditure, uh, state expenditure across all states. So um, I'm trying to think if uh, she may, uh, I can check whether she may uh, have um, specific uh, recommendations re related to that. I can check with her on that. And are you guys looking at the labor shortage as well? That is a um, a big issue. Again, we're, we're just looking at the, the supports that people need, um, but I, I agree that's something that, that needs to be addressed also. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, w I wish I had good answers for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Petty. Sorry, and, and this, I think you addressed this in the last uh, question or part of it at least. So the survey that's going out or the questions that going out to the other states, then that, does that include a, a question about the uh, either state or local input, a financial input about, for the waiting list? I need to double check, but I don't believe we asked about um, the financial expenditure. And thank I you. Can and double then, check on that. Um, yeah, if you could check on that. And then you mentioned it the on the information that you provided us, you said that the following states have eliminated their wait, waiting list in recent years. Do you know the? Is that just they've just dropped them because the next one says they're moving towards some states are moving towards eliminating their waiting list, but then there's a group of states, the four, that have eliminated. So they just 
interesting because you have Missouri's eliminate there, but Missouri's also moving towards uh, moving away from there. So what's the difference? I want to uh, just look to look at, at exactly what we said the next there. To the, it's the last slide. <laughs> Um, I'm not completely sure why Missouri's listed twice. I think it's probably because they had two different waivers, so they might have eliminated one um, and are working to eliminate another one. So one intellectual and developmental disability waiver and another physical disability waiver. Uh, but I'll uh, double check on that to, to be sure. And, and the elimination means they met the needs or they just no longer are gonna have a waiting list? People that were on the waiting list are receiving services. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Fagg. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for your presentation. This is kind of a forced question. When I look at the front page of your program here, it's got KU Center for Developmental Disabilities, the Institute for Health and Disability Policy Studies, and then CRAD, C-R-A-D, Center for Research and Aging. Uh, so you kind of got three organizations out there at KU. Is there any other ones or why are, what, what's, can you explain the difference between the three or what they try to do? Uh, seem like we got a lot of things in the same area. That's my question. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, each of these organizations has different expertise. Um, so um, the, for, for example, the Institute for Health and Disability Policy Studies um, has a lot of expertise in analyzing like Medicaid claims data and things like that. So that, that's the particular part of the project that, that they're really focusing on. They also have some expertise in survey design for people with disabilities. So um, they, they've been supporting our uh, survey development also. Um, uh, uh, Credo uh, has a, a lot of expertise in policy analysis and has done work for KDADS uh, in, in the past, and they're supporting the part of the project related to reaching out to other states um, to, to learn from them. And then um, KUCDD, we, we have a lot of expertise in survey design, um, data analysis, um, and, uh, and things like that. So we're leading the project and uh, contributing a lot of expertise in that area. So I think it's because it's a uh, very quick timeline and a very uh, involved process that needed a lot of people uh, with different expertise. So we, we brought in that expertise. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question, Madam Chair. Uh, have you ever, have, has there ever been a survey done like this before? And if so, was there any action plans that come out of that? It seems like we always do surveys, here's the deal, then it dies. Mm -hmm. So ha has there been surveys done in this area before? Uh, yeah, other states, um, Pennsylvania in particular, uh, had created a survey to understand the, the needs of people on the waiting list. Uh, has Kansas ever done that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Is there any reason why? You, you, that sounds like this is something we should have addressed a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I could speak to, to why, but yeah. No. Okay. Uh, it, it's expensive, so <laughs> that, that could be part of the reason. <laughs> uh, I was also wondering on this one slide here, it's uh, a couple of these hit me kind of funny, unable to locate 488 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that interesting. Incorrect waiting list. What what would be an incorrect waiting list? Was it the form filled out wrong and they caught it somewhere? I just that seemed like a big number for that kind of thing. So uh, I yeah. just wondered if you could maybe comment on that. And in the moved out of state, two fifty seven. Do we ever study the, the move into state? You know, with that kind of thing too. To, so. Um, what, what do you mean by moved into state? Well, if we're studying reasons for removal from waiting lists was moved out of state, mm -hmm. we're watching that kind of thing. It's moved out of state. Do we ever track anybody moving into the state to to understand what kind of demographics are, are working in that area? Uh, just wondering if that was part of the process. 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think through the data that we have. I, uh, I mean, if someone moved into the state, they could join the waiting list. Um, so we would, uh, but I, I don't know that we actually have the data to understand who joined the list after they moved who, into state. Who came to the state and why? Kind of. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to know. You might have a good state that has a good program that people's moving to. Mm -hmm. Well, we got a bad one and they're moving out of. That's kind of what I'm. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, related to your other questions, um, which were, um, I think, the unable to locate and contact. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I know the KDADS has procedures in place to uh, try to contact and stay in contact with, with people. Um, but uh, but I, I think that could be like people that have moved out of state and didn't didn't say, didn't tell anybody, um, or people that have moved around. Um, so I, I don't know all the reasons that, that people might have lost contact. I do know that Kate Edge tries to keep up with people as best they can. But thank you, mm -hmm. Senator. I have a question. All right, Senator Billiger is next, and then we'll come to you, Representative Ballard. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, thank you for being here today. Really appreciate the uh, survey. Um, you know, if, if, if you looked at some of the prior presentation uh, by Michelle, these charts are going the wrong direction. And they continue year after year after year. And you know, it's, it's, it's pretty sad when we say we got 5,000 people waiting and some waiting for 10 years, unacceptable. So I'm really glad that you're trying to dig into that. You know, on your sheet here, you had on the uh, physical disability, the PD, 14 years, and then you just mentioned two and a half. What, what's the difference there? Uh, so I, I think that was a data entry error that, uh, the, the, we were reporting, um, that, uh, I think that data has since been in and been cleaned. So I, I apologize for that as a, <laughs> uh, yeah, a noticeable, uh, difference. Um, but yeah, it was some uh, data that was, uh, incorrect that, that we corrected. Thank you. And, and, and I want to, um, uh, congratulate Senator Fagg for getting some great questions that I was also going to ask, but you know, it, it, it's also, you know, uh, these people deceased, you have to die to get noticed that you're even on the list and, you know, moved out of state. That does happen. I know people that have moved to other states to get services because mm. they couldn't <laughs> stand to wait for 10 years. So, so that does happen. Do we have homeless people that with IDD children or mm -hmm. how can a state let that happen? That's a great question. I mean, that, that, and that's not for you. That's, that's for, <laughs> but that's, you know, and I see that that's just, there shouldn't be zero. There shouldn't be any. I, I just, when I start looking at this, do, do on your survey, are you going to figure out what particular needs these kids need? Because I've, I've said for a long time, and I, I'm going to continue to push this until we get something fixed. I think if we work on both ends of this 5,000, you know, here people have got to have the full meal deal. They need all the services. But there's some that probably don't need the full meal. And I think we can handle a lot of these in our local communities. You know, maybe it's teaching uh, someone to read and write. You know, maybe it's a little basic physical therapy. But when we don't even know what they need, we don't even know how many there are for sure. I mean, these are all estimates. And, and without knowing what services are required, it's pretty hard to try to figure out where we're even at. So I really thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad that the state finally has got off our tuition has decided to pursue this. I mean, it's, 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 we've been pushing this for a long, long time, a long time. Yeah. And, uh, I, I blame a lot of this on the state. I guess another one of your, your, uh, I don't even know, you don't have page numbers on here, but on your collected survey data, 
the demographics, the experiences, and the needs of 1,800 people on the IDD and PD wait list. Is that another typo? 1,800? No, yeah, yeah that, that's how many we're surveying. It's about 20% of the Okay, so you're surveying 1,800 of the 5,000? Right, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, thank you. I think the rest of my questions are for uh, the uh, KDEDs. Well, thank you. Great. Thanks. Representative Ballard. <laughs> and thank you, Madam Chair. For those of you in case you're wondering, I'm in and out. I'm in California, and I'm, I'm in a remote area, so that's why I guess I don't get a picture. But I want to check 35 states you have surveyed, and 15 states, if I'm correct, have responded um, about the ID waiting list. Do you know how many of those states with lower lists have approved Medicaid expansion? Uh, that, that's that's a great question. I, I do not have that information in front of me, but I can uh, I can look into that and uh, find out for you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. The reason I ask that question is there's only 10 states that have not approved Medicaid expansion. And if you've received 15 states, if they have a much lower rate, then they're able to eliminate their waiting list a lot earlier. And maybe because we have not, that has placed a major part in why our list is so long. The other thing, are we the only state that really talk, talks about 10 years on the waiting list? I think our uh, waiting list is the, the longest. There was one other state that, that was uh, uh, close to 10 years also. And for the previous person asking the question about it, it's a shame that people have to die on the waiting list, and maybe they could receive other services. I think that is part of why we are proposing the mini waiver in order to provide more services, but I'm not sure that will totally eliminate or take that many people off of the waiting list. So if you could find that information, I think it's valuable, not because I'm trying to push Medicaid expansion, but it is to show that Medicaid expansion can serve your people in your state maybe quicker and they not have to die on the waiting list. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to be clear, 67% uh, of the folks that are on the, way, uh, on the waiting list already receive Medicaid expan uh, Medicaid. So Medicaid expansion would not help maybe 30%, but I would venture to say that most of the people that aren't on Medicaid are on private pay through their parents or something like that. So just to kind of nip this Medicaid expansion deal in the bud here real quick. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. The reason I always keep myself last when I'm chairing a committee is I tick off questions that I had that others, other committee members ask. So I appreciate that. So we do this biannually. And so that would have been, as um, Representative Mason mentioned, so 2016, so we would have had one into 18, 2020, 2018, 2022. Um, and then you mentioned that your data is going back to May, I believe, of 2022. We won't hear the results till 2024. So then we start a brand new survey all over again. Do they always take two years? Well, uh, just to clarify, I, I think the survey that's done every two years is related to um, uh, rates. Um, so that, that's different from the, the study that we're doing to study people on the waiting list. I but, see. Yeah. Uh, and is this the first time you've done this, or have you done this in the past? It's the first time we've done it, for sure. Uh, to, to my knowledge, it's the first time it's been done in the state, but I could be wrong about that. Very good. Um, why would someone, do we have any data 
of why someone would remove themselves from the waiting list? That's a great question um, and, and something that, um, that I, I don't think I can answer. But yeah, that would be worth talking to, to families and people about. And we, we know that some people have waited up to 10 and a half years, but the average is six years, which is similar to some other states, correct? Uh, correct. Um, but as Representative Carpenter pointed out, that's, that, that's not necessarily how long the average time that people wait to get service. It's just the amount of average amount of time that people are on the waiting list. So we don't know how long it'll take for them to receive not service. Not to say six years is great. It's right. not at all. Yeah. It's just that it's not every single person is waiting 10.5 years. I serve on the IDD study committees for several of the national organizations of legislators. And as we meet, you were talking about a consortium, and as we meet together and talk about this, we end up walking away scratching our heads because some of them were like, well, as Senator Petty said, we just kind of eliminated our list. I mean, we just are, they don't they're not necessarily on a waiting list anymore. That doesn't seem to help the issue, does it? Um, but then there are those who, you know, found some dollars here or there, and they're like, it's kind of a Band-Aid for now. We took off some of those people. I don't know if we're going to be able to provide services going forward, however, but at least for now we have, you know, people off the waiting list. So it's, it's not a simple solution. I would also um, follow up with uh, what was asked earlier about the survey and done a lot of surveys in my lifetime and the 20% is not, you know, out of the realm of being a valid survey. However, my concern about that is, as you said, random, but it is spread across the state, you say? So random within this area, random within this area. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. All right. Um, and do we know how many of the 20% that you sent out, what percentage of those have been returned? We haven't sent those out yet, but oh. we will track that very closely, so, okay. so we'll be able to report that. Yeah. Oftentimes, a survey can be daunting, and people get this, it's 22 pages, and they're like, well, um, there, I have so much to say, but I don't necessarily want to fill all of this out, particularly if it's open-ended and not, um, you know, a list or um, multiple choice or something of that nature. So I'm glad that you're going to be following up with a phone call, assisting people in who sending that, or we get a very limited return on our surveys. Glad to hear that. Committee, do we have other questions for the doctor? Seeing none, thank you so much thank for being here. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Rep or Senator Billinger, I think you said you had another question. Uh, sorry, to, I missed this earlier, but... Financially ineligible. Is this a, a situation where maybe the parents passed away and left money to the the, the IDD uh, person, and they're no longer eligible? Is that is or how, how? What is that? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, that 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 could be a case. Yeah, it, it just means that that their um, income is more than the the Medicaid threshold. Yeah, because 326 people. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I I. I I guess I'd like to get a little more information on that. I'll try to get that from KDADS. And then why would they no longer meet the criteria, the eligibility criteria? Um, Go ahead, doctor. Or is that something we should get the information from KDADS? When they, when, uh, yeah, I think that would be a, yeah, okay. a good question for KDADS. Great, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, Representative Ballard, did you have a question or were you just commenting on that answer? Oh, no, I was just commenting on the answer. Thank okay. You, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And now we're going to ask the commissioner to come back up to the microphone. And one of the things I would like to address before you begin is other states talked about how they did partial services. That was just mentioned. Have they, and I think Representative, uh, or Senator Billinger brought that up. I'd like for you to address that in this community support that you're going to talk about now um, the, in that waiver. And I think that that would be helpful for us to know, couldn't we do that? 
I know other states are doing that now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so one of the solutions we have to, to help address the waiting list is to look at a developing a community support waiver. A community support waiver for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities provides a limited set of supports for those that have that have a place to live in the community and receive substantial unpaid support from family and friends. A community support waiver could serve both youth and adults. The services offered on a community support waiver could be tailored to meet the needs of individuals that have fewer support needs. Residential services would not be offered on this waiver. Our two most expensive services on the comprehensive waiver are residential and day services. Because it would have a, a limited menu of services, a community support waiver would cost less per person to operate. Total costs would be highly dependent on the specific services offered and at any criteria that may impact its utilization. So currently on our waiver right now, we have a comprehensive IDD waiver. It includes all of these services, assistive services, adult day supports, financial management services, medical alert rental, overnight respite, personal care services, residential supports for adults, residential supports for children, enhanced care services is really just sleep support, specialized medical care, which is nursing, should someone need nursing, supported employment, supportive home care, wellness monitoring, and then we have targeted case management, which is in a waiver service, it's a state plan service. So we did some cost estimates for community support waiver. Based on recommendations for the 2022 Special Committee on uh, IDD waiver modernization, KDADS has developed an estimate for a potential new community support waiver. Several considerations went behind these estimates. We put a cap of $20,000 per person per year for this waiver. Uh, note the Missouri waiver is capped at 28,000. Range of participants from 3,600 to 7,461 can be further refined based on finding of the KUCDD waitlist study. Emphasis on supported employment as well as respite, training, personal care options, anticipated increase in self-directed services, cost split between the feds and the state will be approximately 60% from the federal government and 40% from the state. <clears throat> Would work with CDDOs and other stakeholders to roll out the waiver in a phased approach. Could take more than two years to develop and receive CMS approval for a new waiver. Additional administrative staff needed to develop and implement a new waiver. Potential cost ranges from 72 million all funds, including 29 million SGF, to 149 million all funds, and including 40 million SGF when fully implemented. So as I said earlier, we did look at Missouri's uh, just as a, a way to figure out cost and the services that they offered. Again, they do not offer residential or day services and we wouldn't want to do that either. Um, they have a service for transportation, supported employment, individual directed goods and services, personal, personal care uh, agency and then self-directed respite services for families, um, both agency and self-directed. Therapy, including behavior support, like ABA therapies, assistive technology, independent living or community engagement skills, family caregiver support and training, um, financial management services and support brokers, and benefits counseling. So as I said, KDADS has used Missouri's community support waiver to develop initial cost analysis for services, uh, submitted proposal to CMS to use FMAP funds to hire staff to develop this waiver and help engage stakeholders for the writing of the waiver application. 
The majority of these funds will go to develop and enhance provider network services. We have 2 million targeted to go out to community service providers who are currently providing services um, to develop these new services um, so that they can provide those services to individuals on the community support waiver. We're also looking for the results of the waiting list study to also inform the process. And the last page, and I shared this in Bethel, was just an estimate about how long it would take for us to develop a waiver. Um, and if we were to start this month, and we were hoping that we will get approval this month, we are looking to, uh, that we would have approval from CMS by March of 2026. Jeez. I can now stand for questions. Committee, are there questions for the commissioner? Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Michelle. Yes. This would, if, if we did um, move in this direction for this community support waiver, um, I mean, it sounds promising, but I'm, and I understand the financial constraints here, but the recommendation is 20,000, whereas like, for example, Missouri is already at 20, would you say 28 or 29,000? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think we're talk, talk, starting a little low here um, when we look at that, uh, because these services don't go down, they just continue to go up. That's been one of the biggest complaints about when it comes to um, personal care uh, and that we're not spending, that we're not paying enough and they can't keep employ. The question was asked earlier about, you know, uh, the workforce. And I don't know that this helps with the whole workforce need. Uh, it just makes it now a, a larger financial gap. Uh, and then, but I guess my real question is with, if we did move in this direction, now aren't we just committing, creating two different lists? So I'll answer the first part of your question. The, the 20,000 was, a, we were giving estimates based on a request from this committee for a 20,000 cap. We can certainly do one at a $28,000 cap. Um, we would, it would be pretty complex, but we would look at those already for, for, the, for the waiting list, and it may create two. But we would look at people who are on the comprehensive waiver who aren't using all of those comprehensive services that may want to switch over to the community support waiver, um, which would save money because we wouldn't be paying the same capitated rate to the MCOs for that. It would be less than what's on the co comprehensive waiver. Um, some may want to do that, some may not. We will have to look at that. Um, our, our goal is to roll this out and to be successful with it. We see it being rolled out in phases um, because the, not only um, do we want to serve these people, but we have, we have to have a provider network to do so. And so that's why we're contributing, you know, 2 million FMAP dollars to providers to um, develop the services for this waiver. And then just as a follow-up, so when you talk about the uh, rolling out in phases, but yet um, not having uh, CMS approval until 26. Mm -hmm. So are we talking about rolling out in phases after 26? Correct. We, we can't provide any waiver services until we have CMS approval. Okay. That's what I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. We'll be joining with stakeholders to figure out how to roll it out so that we assure that we have a provider network to support uh, the people coming out onto that waiver. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to put this in context, we met last year. We had an ID and DD, and we met. We met seven states, testified, all kinds of studied this out a lot of states are doing this same thing it's not we're not reinventing the wheel here a um, couple things so when i started looking into the waiver, everybody was talking about the wait list when i got here in the legislature it's been here forever and uh, 
start digging into it, well, I just thought, well, we'll just it's twenty million dollars a year. We'll just cough up twenty million dollars a year. Finally, you know how people don't tell legislators what they should tell them because they're afraid of what they're going to do. So finally, these folks got together, and I think they drew straws to see who was going to tell me that we didn't have the capacity to take care of one of those people, let alone the whole wait list. And so I'm sitting there going, huh? And so uh, Senator Millinger has been very helpful. A lot of you guys have been. We put in a lot of money to the IDD uh, pool to build capacity. Our providers are in better shape than they've been for a long time to try to take this. So that it's just not one of those things that you just snap your fingers and do. So anyway, we met last year. The waivers that we have, the 14 services comprehensive waiver costs about $48,000 a year. This costs about 20. And I, I could go on for a long time, but I'm not, I'm gonna wrap it up very quickly. So I believe, and again, there was some discussion about this, about, well, why don't we wait for a study? Well, you know what? We've been waiting for a study. It's ahead of the cart. We should wait for KU to do this, to see those services. But we met with 36 different providers and all that stuff last year. They told us what services they wanted to, that they needed. So anyway, uh, I'll just wrap that up real quick. <laughs> but anyway, you can get me started on this. But. I think it's good. I, I believe personally that we'll probably take half the people off the wait list, either that are, are on the comprehensive waiver that don't need all 14 services. They're going to go to the seven or whatever on this one. And we'll be able to take the other folks off of the waiver because those slots are freed up. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Bellinger has a yes. Um, Senator Billiger, and then I'll call on you, Representative Ballard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, thank Representative Carpenter and Mason. I know they've done a lot of work on this through the years, and I, I really appreciate them. Uh, I guess on this sheet that we just had with the doctor, you know, uh, maybe you can answer this, but uh, why would 700 people no longer meet Programs eligibility criteria. You got any idea on that one? Which, which document are you referring to? Uh, reasons for waiting list removal. Okay, so that there could be, there's a couple of things that could happen. Um, one is sometimes we, uh, the medical professional will um, see a child and diagnose them with a developmental delay. Um, at a young age, they don't actually give them an intellectual or developmental disability diagnosis until they're older. So they would go back and reevaluate that child to see if they have an actual intellectual disability or developmental disability. And some children do fall off that list because they don't meet criteria. Another criteria can be that for eligibility would be KDHE when they um, go through and do the financial eligibility part, they would fall off the list if they don't meet uh, financial eligibility. And as I think you said, maybe if they had a lot of assets in their own name, that could be problematic for that person that aren't protected by a special needs trust. So if a family puts it in a trust and just to make sure that when they're gone, this child is taken care of, that could throw them out of eligibility. If they, well, actually, no, if they set it up in a, a special needs trust, which will protect it um, from uh, from not interfering with their eligibility, but, and I am not a lawyer, so I can't speak to this, but it has to be set up in a special way so that even though they may have these assets, it won't be counted uh, towards their, against their eligibility. Thank you for, uh uh, clarifying that point. And so um, I asked the doctor about, we have people in Kansas that are kicked off because they're homeless? Um, not to my knowledge, no. I don't know where they got their numbers, but shows- There are people that shows are homeless? 24 here. I'm sorry? I said it, the sheet shows 24. Okay. Um, I, I would suggest, I know there's a special committee meeting in November on homelessness, and you, that's a, 
that may be a good place for us to take that question. Well, my concern is that a family gets homeless because the state's not helping take care of an IDD individual. That's my concern. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to cl clarify that point. So the, I think the table you're, you're referring to is the reasons that people have entered services through a crisis exception, that there are a, a group of people that have entered because they were at risk for homelessness. Oh, that was on the, but there was also on the other sheet you had homelessness. I find it here. Or maybe I looked at it wrong. The blue tables are the... Um, Okay, that's the reasons that are there, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, sorry to interrupt, okay. just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Thank you. So that's a good deal, that if someone is on the verge of being homeless, the state steps in and takes care of yes. Thank you. I, that, I'm, thanks for the clarification. I, I misread that. Thank you. Representative Ballard. You know, I just want to agree with what Representative Carpenter said about this new community waiver. We've been criticized for so long about our long waiting list and the needs of people and everything. I know we'll take 26 as with Kate, but I think it might be partially an answer to people that say, why so long? We don't need all of those services. We just need a few of them. I if that would be the answer. And I just want to say, you know, we are trying. And I have told my constituents that repeatedly. We are trying to do what we can to eliminate that waiting list and provide the services that Kansans so desperately need. And I just wanted to agree. Ken, I may not agree on Medicaid expansion, but we do agree on this community waiver. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do agree on eliminating the waiver, absolutely. Um, or the waiting list for the waiver. Other questions, committee? Yes, Representative Haswood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, I know there's some correlation with folks who um, might have a disability and uh, being incarcerated. Um, what does that look like if someone was incarcerated and they were receiving services? Um, is, is that a common situation? Maybe foster care system as well? Does how does the, the, that system flow? So that's a, that's a very good question. We do have a, a number of members uh, in, who are in the, in the waiver and some do end up in being incarcerated for any number of reasons. We have a project we've been working on called the sequential intercept model to look at how um, persons with IDD um, end up being incarcerated and trying to figure out uh, points of uh, contact where we can avoid getting them into services, getting them into uh, jail. Um, so we're still working on that. But when someone um, is in jail, um, when they come back out onto the way that they can come back out onto the waiver. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Committee, other questions? I have a couple. Um, do we know, I've reached, I've texted a good friend who's a colleague in Missouri who works on this issue and don't have an answer back yet. He said, I'll find out. But perhaps you know, what percentage of the people in Missouri who have reached the cap of 28,000? I, I don't have that information, I'm okay. sorry. Because I think that would be important to know. Yeah. You know, we could make it 30,000, we could make it 35, but the important thing is about how often do people cap out? And it'd be nice to know if we thought most of the people, 20 would be enough. So that would be good, a good inf information to have. I'll reach out, and if you could reach out as well, yeah, that so would be great. I, I should point out, Missouri isn't a managed care state for long-term services, right. so we pay a capitated rate to our MCOs, mm -hmm. and regardless of whether the person caps out or not, they still need to serve them because there's going to be someone else they're serving that doesn't reach the full the full rate. They That's just agree to, to serve them. That's very good to know. Thank you. Yep. Um, this, and I 
I really like this concept. I liked it when I heard it here recently when meeting with other states, that they found there were lots of people on this waiting list, like, all I really need is that, that, and that, yet they're still waiting for the whole, the full boat. Right. Um, and I agree with Representative Carpenter, if we can get started on this process right away, because it does take till 2026 um, for us to know if um, the CMS is going to approve it. I know they've approved it in other states. I think we would have a very good chance of that. I also know that your department is very good about filling out these applications and crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. Mm -hmm. um, it's exciting to me to be able to say that we in Kansas have also taken off a lot of folks. And your estimate, I believe, is between 3,400 up to the current as to how many people could benefit with this partial waiver, correct? Yeah, that, that's, yeah. We're, we're looking at that. And, you know, I agree, Senator Gossage, um, there are many people on the waiting list that don't need the full boat. Yes. And there are many people, a number of people on the comprehensive waiver that don't need or want the full right. boat. So we're going to be really working hard to figure out what people are needing partially through the waiting list study, what people are actually waiting for to help us design uh, a waiver that's going to meet mm -hmm. the needs of Kansas in a, Kansans in a fis fiscally responsible manner. And my understanding is those folks that would need the full waiver could still benefit from the partial, correct? They don't have to still sit there and wait because they need all the services. They could still go ahead and take advantage of the partial waiver. I, I think some some f folks could that don't need day in residential. Maybe they will need that in their future. Mm -hmm. Maybe as long as they're living with family members, that's not an issue. But maybe when caregivers age to a point where they can't care anymore, they would want to move to the comprehensive waiver. So in other words, we have all of the folks that are on the waiting list right now would benefit from, and I'm calling it a partial waiver. What's the actual term? Community support Community waiver. support waiver. Yes. So the folks that could benefit from that would actually be everyone. There are definitely services they could benefit from, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Unless they are just specifically waiting for like residential or day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thank you. And we have a question from Representative Carpenter. More of a clarification. We In committee, we discussed this at length. And if someone wanted to try the waiver light or the community support waiver, they would have their slot held on the comprehensive waiver in case they couldn't uh, operate, you know, wasn't enough services. So we, we talked about that at length, and I think that's only fair to do that. They try the light. If it doesn't meet their needs, then they can go back. But I think a lot of people will have their needs met with the light. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, committee, other questions for uh, Michelle, our commissioner? Seeing none, we're right on target. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, turn to our 11 o'clock. She's online. And she's online. That's perfect. Thank you, Dayton. Um, and the presentation on IDD waiver uh, rates by individuals, providers, and organizations. And this should be Holly Creamer, correct? Holly, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. I apologize that I can't be there in person. I'm located in my office in Russell, Kansas. Um, again, I know I've uh, been out there before to speak with with members from the Bethel committee. Um, we continue with here at our organization with Kansas Behavior Supports. Uh, to provide ABA therapy throughout the state of Kansas. Um, we still average about 90 to 100 children that we serve um, currently in the state, with about 50% of those kids being in rural areas, which I'm very proud and want to continue to provide that services of high quality interventions for our children in rural areas. Um, the reason I wanted to speak more today is I'd like to address the global concerns as it pertains to ongoing services for our children and families. Um, we very often hear about this concern with the IDD waiver as I'm servicing these children and families throughout Kansas. Um, but we have to also dive deeper into the issue as to how we're going to provide these services that are needed um, as we have these waivers approved. Unfortunately, uh, we check in 
quite often with our families regarding uh, their wait list for the autism and the IDD waiver. And I do hear that five to 10 year wait list. Um, only one of our uh, kiddos is actually on the waiver service and the rest is on the waiting list or um, they don't see the point in applying because they hear the horror stories about the wait list. So we are one of those agencies that are providing services and are here to help our families that do have Medicaid and are on those wait lists. Um, so we're very proud that we get to connect with them. Uh, we work with our children on social skills, communication skills, daily living skills, helping to reduce maladaptive behaviors. We coordinate and collaborate with their schools on behavior interventions and their progress. Uh, we also provide parent and family training to our families. That's also a part of their treatment plan is to provide parent and family goals that they want to work on as well. So we're here to help and we want to continue to provide these services for our families that are on these waiting lists, but it is continuing to still be in a struggle to be sustainable. There are huge waiting lists for ABA services throughout Kansas right now. I had a, a family last week in an area that I was having trouble serving and didn't have the staff there. I called around and, and no longer ABA agencies saying a two year wait list. I was told a 77 family wait list. Um, this is very concerning. The reason that we don't have enough providers in Kansas is because of the reimbursement rate. Um, as I had mentioned previously before, um, when you compare Kansas Medicaid reimburse, reimbursements for ABA codes, we are still the lowest out of the surrounding states. Um, I've provided the reimbursement codes for Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, Missouri, and we're still sitting at the lowest. Um, in 2021, the Autism Task Team uh, Force, they did a beautiful report and submitted it to KDADS. And one of the immediate actions that needed to be done on that report was to incentivize providers and increase the rates for ABA reimbursement rates. Up to my knowledge, this still hasn't been able to be done. There's a lot of challenges that we face in providing these services to our specifically our rural families is we have a lot of travel and mileage associated. As you know, out this way, all the towns are usually about 30 miles apart. Um, and we try to have as many high quality and educated providers that we can in certain areas, but a lot of them have to be willing to put in some miles in between clients and to serve that time that we're needing for them with our individual children. We need to have more ongoing resources and training for our technicians and supervisory staff. Uh, Kansas has done a great job in allowing autism specialists at a master's level uh, that other states don't. And we're very proud of that. Um, but there's still a large gap between our technician level for children and then the master's level. And we have to be able to provide other positions in there um, to keep people interested in growing and learning in the field and having that high quality service delivery. Um, we need to be able to hire a higher 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 education staff that are between that technician and supervisory educational level. Um, there's a lot of efforts and work involved behind the scenes. There's so much scheduling that goes into uh, scheduling our children for services, scheduling initial assessments, coordinating with schools, coordinating with other uh, providers, whether it's OT, PT, speech, uh, psychiatric care. Oftentimes we're coordinating care for children that have been in residential and they're trying to move out of res residential back into their home, but they wanna make sure that we're in place and able to provide those services before that occurs. Um, these wait lists, thank you so much today for talking about this and all the efforts that are going into identifying this and what we need to do about it. And it's great to get people off of the wait list, but then again, it's about the services and how are those services gonna be reimbursed for. I have had providers or insurance carriers reach out to me wanting us to do respite care for the IDD waiver, but that's something that we can't even touch and provide for families when we can't keep up with the need for our ABA services that we're doing with families for children with autism. Um, I'm very committed to continuing our services in our rural areas and throughout Kansas, um, but this issue of reimbursement rates for ABA and where we are compared to other states, is just not sustainable. And again, the reason we don't have enough providers is because of the reimbursement rates. 
I've talked to other companies that have considered having more providers in Kansas, but what, what I hear is we can't do that. Kansas is not sustainable. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I am open to any questions. Thank you very much, Holly. Committee, we have eight people who are conferees during this hour. Uh, each of them will have five minutes. That just gives us like one and a half, two minutes for questions. So instead of waiting till the end, I'm just going to give allow you to ask a question right then. So do we have any questions for Holly before we move on to our next presenter? Thank you so much, Holly. Next, we'll have Matt Fletcher, who's the executive director for Interhab. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning and to discuss the challenges that are faced by the Kansas IDD provider network due to chronic underfunding caused by irregular updates to provider reimbursement. Uh, I'd also like to share our members' recommendations on what would comprise a meaningful review of costs that providers incur in providing service and also adequate funding levels that would be needed in order to ensure the future viability of the IDD service network. And I, I'm struck today as I'm listening to the conversation at just how many uh, members of this committee have been instrumental in the past few years in shepherding some significant increases for the IDD provider network. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't start my comments by saying thank you for the dedication that uh, you have shown to these issues. But if you would allow me a metaphor, I would liken the work that you have done to date much to uh, a MASH unit in a war zone, triaging the immediate and critical needs that are coming in the door and tending to those who most need the support, um, but not able to do much more than meatball surgery. And what I hope to speak to you about today is, is about us entering a new phase, a phase in which we can start to build a strong foundation for the IDD service system moving forward so that we can do the much needed modernization, uh, things such as the community support waiver, addressing the waiting list, meeting the increasingly complex needs of this population. All of that work awaits you and us, and we look forward to doing that together with you. But the foundational element that we need to put in place and we need to get right in order to do all of that work, to do more than just to triage, is to make sure that the funding mechanism for this system is regular and is adjusting for the costs of doing business. It seems like a simple thing, but it's eluded us to date here in the state of Kansas. We have an opportunity together to put a piece in place with an upcoming study, a review of reimbursement, that I believe will begin to build that foundational element that you'll need in order to address those, those more aspirational elements that we've talked about so far this morning. Um, you know, our system is really plagued by two symptoms uh, of the same malady. The first is the um, uh, very precarious capacity to the IDD service network that exists today, those 9,000 plus individuals that are in service. Uh, our system is very brittle. Uh, even with the increases over the last few years, uh, it's very difficult for providers to stretch and meet the ever increasing complex needs of this population because the reimbursement foundation is just, we're just not quite there yet. So that's the first symptom of the malady. The second symptom is this waiting list that you've heard so much about this morning. 5,000 plus individuals waiting up to 10 plus years. It's shameful. We should do something about it. But these are both symptoms of the same illness, and that is that we have not invested to the degree that we needed to in this program, invested in terms of dollars, but also investing in terms of strategic vision. You have the beginnings of 
what you would need to articulate a strategic vi vision in the Kansas Developmental Disabilities Reform Act. It was passed in 1995 and signed into law by Governor Bill Graves. And it contains, to this day, some of the most progressive statutory language at the state level for a system of this kind. However, I would argue in the 28 years since it was passed that we've done very little to carry out the promise of the Kansas DD Reform Act. One thing I do wanna note, and it's relevant to the work that will be done on a, re, a review of reimbursement, is the language in the Kansas Developmental Disabilities Reform Act specific to the, the requirement to provide adequate and reasonable funding. Those are the words used in the statute, adequate and reasonable funding for the IDD system. And in order for you all to provide that adequate and reasonable funding, the statute uh, put in a mechanism for regular adjustments to reimbursement. I've included the actual statutory language in my testimony. I encourage you to look at it because it calls for a review of five elements of the IDD service system. Again, the language is really good here in terms of, of, of articulating what a legislator might need in terms of data to help in rate setting for the future. I'd like to close with just indicating our members' recommendations for this upcoming reimbursement review that you called for through legislative proviso in the last session. There are five things that if I could respectfully request of this committee that you would take and you would carry forward in your recommendations. There are five things that we believe should be included in any reimbursement review. First, the review should incorporate appropriate inflationary indexes as part of its examination of service costs. So cost of doing business for everyone goes up every year. But somehow in the IDD provider network, they've not been they've not been able to, to have that same kind of regular adjustment just for inflationary increases. So we need to make sure that that is included in the next examination. Second, all service-related costs should be examined. In past reimbursement reviews conducted by the state, they've not always been very good about looking at the full spectrum of costs of service. So we would encourage that all service costs are examined. All five elements contained in the statute need to be examined as well. And that includes items that aren't just attached to the HCBS waiver. You all had an issue last session, uh, the TCM uh, the targeted case management rate. You had to go back in and adjust because it wasn't attached to the waiver. I'll, I'll yeah, wrap up here. Five minutes are, are passed, so if you uh, could wrap up. Thank you, Matt. And then finally, the uh, review should uh, recommend at a minimum to you an inflationary increase uh, based upon what was experienced in the past year. I've included in my testimony some of the important reasons why this is so critical we get it right, including just one factoid I'll leave you with. 26% job growth in direct support professional positions by 2029, that's what's forecasted. So we've got, to, we've got to get this right. We have to set our foundation and that begins with a good review of reimbursement rates. With that, I'll close and stand for any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions for Matt and directly after Matt, we will have Nick Wood who's also with Interhath. Yes, uh, oh, Representative Haswick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I've been looking at uh, this piece of testimony I think you guys submitted in 2021, uh, a strategic roadmap. And in uh, this report, you um, said with the funding that, you know, this has been a two decade problem and with inflation of uh, provider rates increased by 35.2% and then uh, inflation measured by consumer price index increased by 63.86%. Um, do you have a number, a dollar amount that that we need to address this problem? Do you have that data of how many years had the state legislator not approved that funding or matched that funding? that deficit, I guess. Those are great questions. On the second question, do we, can we 
provide you with the information about what years funding was increased and at what levels, absolutely. To the, your first question, do I have the, the magic number of what is needed? Unfortunately, no, I don't. Um, one of the most frustrating things, and I recently shared this with Senator Marshall's staff as well, because they're doing some work at the federal level that could be helpful to the work you do here at the state level. So thank you to Senator Marshall for supporting a very important piece of legislation in his uh, committee a couple of weeks ago. But um, one of the things I shared in, with, with his staff is how frustrating it's been over the past several years. Every year, uh, we have to do our best to try and calculate what you should be looking at. And every year, I think you all scramble for the same types of data. And so that's one of the things I think is so critical about this uh, reimbursement review that's called for in statute, that we get it right. So we all have good data to be working off of. Um, Senator Billinger remarked about how great it was to finally be starting to get the data we need on, on the uh, waiting list. Well, you all need that information. And that's why uh, I'm really hopeful we get a solid review of funding accomplished and presented to you for the next legislative session. Thank you. Next we have Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I uh, really appreciate the testimony that you provided us and the information about this direct support population. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in, our, in the legislature talking about workforce yeah. and how important it is to grow the workforce. And we look at all areas. And I know we spent a lot of time last year looking at um, this workforce right. specifically. And if we want to grow it, we're going to have to pay for it. Yeah. And it's a great way of looking at how we can address um, our lower income families. Because when I see, which is not, I mean, I'm not surprised, but 87% are female yeah. and that, and they're minorities, and that 62% of them are full-time providers, but yep. yet they don't make a living income. Right. So they can't pay for their needs, their basic needs, and we're not raising the quality yes. of care. So we continue yep. that cycle of having unemployment and, uh, and, and we're paying for that. So it, it, it's, it really is important for us to look at this and how we can address it. And especially when you mentioned the, how that need is going to be increasing, not decreasing. We had that same thing just last week talking about our aging Kansans and the needs. So they're also in that, uh, that workforce need as well. So thanks for this information. I think it will really help us oh. with making decisions. You're absolutely right. 42% turnover among DSPs, and every time turnover occurs, there's a cost to that. We've not looked at the data on turnover costs in a long time, but it probably is in excess of $2,000 per, per person who walks out the door, would be my guess. Some of the folks behind me probably can tell you in dollars and cents. Uh, Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Matt, thanks for the information. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, and I think it's in your testimony, not over 9,000 clients being serviced throughout the, the Kansas system. Um, are those, is that just the ones on the, the waiver, or is that everyone? Is that private pay and the waiver? So the 9,000 figure comes from the waiver, uh, those who are served by the waiver. So the total number, uh, I would yield to the state. They, have the, they are the keepers of the data for those in the system, and they probably have the exact number as of uh, uh, very recent past. All right. Uh, do, you, do you have an idea of what the percentage is, the breakdown of, of private pay to, to waiver? We can get that information for you, Representative, but there's very little private pay in our system. Okay. Uh, is there someone from the state who could approach the, the podium and tell me how many are, are not on the Medicaid waiver but private pay? Um, I don't believe we collect that data. It is a small number. Um, we just track the data for those people in services um, through the waiver. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee, other questions? 
I just have a quick question, sure. Matt, and that is um, I didn't see cost estimations, and perhaps that was the question that uh, Representative Mason was asking. Um, you're saying, you know, we need more money to be able to fund these services, but of course, sitting up here, and we have budget folks up here going, how much per beneficiary, et cetera. So it'd be good for you to work with the state to be able to get those numbers back to us. Absolutely. We love working with the state, and we're Actually. excited for the upcoming review. Thank you, Matt. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Nick, we're ready for you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me today. Thank you for uh, looking at this topic of rate studies. Um, I, I sort of, I've been looking at this more as, you know, rate studies as good policy. I'm not the operations or budget expert, <laughs> although there's plenty of those in the room today. So some of your questions m maybe would be better answered by them. Um, but I, I, I guess I'd direct, direct your attention to the backside of my testimony, the second page. And then just very quickly try to touch on the the points um, that I think would be informative. Um, so the backside sort of has an outline of the key components of a rate, and they, this is based on rate studies that we've seen in other states. Uh, Missouri has mentioned several times today; they they're a good uh, example for us on rate studies too. Um, and just as you kind of glance over those, I want to say that um, comparisons against inflationary indexes are really just a bare minimum of how you develop proposed annual adjustments. Um, the occupational codes that are referenced in the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics or by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that are used as comparisons, they're just comparisons. They don't match up evenly with direct support professionals and what they do. Uh, and there's some other considerations that have to be made. Um, for example, um, at Matt touched on this earlier. There, there, there was a presumption at least 10, 12 years ago in Kansas that um, we would have these five tiers and we would serve uh, proportions of people off of from each tier. Um, for a number of reasons, that didn't work out that way. Um, uh, mainly because of the waiting list. And so the more that we've been relying on crisis exceptions, the more people with a higher, more, higher severity of disability have been accessing the waiver. So um, the, with prevalence data on IDD, you know, there, there's, um, about, there's mild, moderate, profound, and severe, uh, or severe and profound. Um, and 85% of people with IDD just generally have a mild form of disability. Severe and profound are, are about 5% each or less. Um, those folks, that, that 5%, are about half the people on the waiver, according to the information that KDATS has. So, so the severity of disability has been going up, and of course their staffing, staffing needs go up. Um, that's one thing that that we have to keep in mind with the rate study. Also, um, uh, we should be looking at all costs of providing a service. So um, uh, when, the, when they do these rate studies across states, they recognize that certain things might cost more in one part of the state than another. And so they'll develop ranges, and, and that's based on actual market costs for these different activities. Um, and also, all, review all types of service provision. Um, you know, there's a lot of variety in the types of services that are provided on the on the waiver. So it's a it's kind of a menu of services. Some people with more complex needs use more of a certain type of service. We're also talking about sort of um, bolstering some services that have been underutilized, but would probably help meet a lot of unmet need out there. But one of those services that is um, that, that has to be factored in, it's not an HCBS service necessarily, is transportation. So it's, it's expensive to provide um, paratransportation to people with disabilities, people have amb um, ambulatory issues. Um, it's expensive to hire drivers and also to purchase vans and uh, pay for maintenance. So just when you look at the key components of the rate on the back, there are the direct care and other program staff wages. So those are sort of the, the comparable 
um, occupations that you might compare wage, the cost of wages and benefits against. Um, there are employee-related expenses, such as medical insurance, your um, employer taxes, workers' comp. There's productivity, and so you're, you're factoring in the PTO, non-billable time. Uh, and then other, other service-related costs, staff training, staff-related supplies, transportation, and then, of course, administration and overhead. Uh, if you have any questions, so I'll, I'll stand for those now. Nick, thank you. Any questions, committee? Senator Petty. Uh, I'll make this quick. I, I appreci appreciate you, Nick, pre breaking this down because um, I know that um, last year as we heard about this, whether it was in public health and welfare or whether it was in ways it means that often uh, there would be a complaint among the consumers saying, well, you're saying that you're paying so much per hour, but the employee is only getting this, and why should the employer be, you know, be getting a, a portion of, of that amount of money? And, and when you break this down, uh, it, it does make it clear that in order, and just as you mentioned transportation, uh, that in order to cover those other costs, um, that uh, we have to really take that into consideration when we're making about, thinking about, uh, talking about an hourly rate. Uh, that, that doesn't, that has to cover the whole gamut and not just the employee. Would that be correct? Right, and, and so there ends up becoming a range they, the range could be regional, or it could be the types of services that are provided by a specific provider or by that DSP. Um, so some some services, you know, if I'm working with someone who has a lot of complex needs, plus they're a two-person lift in the morning, I have to be trained on how to do that. Um, there's some, some liability insurance that my employer has to cover, so there's risks to my health and that sort of thing. So all of those things are sort of factored in um, with with a good rate study. And one thing that we had heard, um, I think last year, might have been the year before, was the fact that um, if we don't think about just the salary, if we don't think about benefits, that we aren't going to be able to keep the employees in the field. Right. That That's, uh, um, you know, what what kinds of benefits and what kind of a pay scale do you need to lower the the um, the turnover rates, improve recruitment? Um, because I, and they'll tell you today, <laughs> turnover rates can really eat up your your budget. So, Thank you, yeah. Nick. If I remember correctly, uh, and it was mentioned earlier in a report that we uh, the legislature passed um, allowing the twenty five percent increase in the rates for this community. That's substantial, wouldn't you agree? That, that was wonderful, yes. Um, so what we are then, as we're looking at this rate increase study, you're just giving us ex examples to say, hey, as you're doing that, keep these things in mind. Yeah, Is that what yeah. I hear you saying? And it was kind of, it was, um, kind of the question that Matt received earlier. Um, what, you know, had, had there been regular rate increases over the last 20, 25 years, where would we be at? And then I, I think also, you know, the point of a study is you're, you're looking at the what what does the market bear? What's com what's comparable out there? So what can you actually hire a DSP for in Johnson County or Garden City? Um, it's important to look at state specific or region specific information. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Next, we have Lori Feldkamp with Big Lakes Developmental Center. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as you said, my name is Lori Feldkamp and I'm with Big Lakes in Manhattan. Uh, Big Lakes is a, a community service provider for, for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And in 2023, we are celebrating 50 years of service to Riley, Gary, Pottawatomie, and Clay counties. So we're really proud of that. Um, now I'm really going to date myself and tell you I've been part of Big Lakes for 29 of those years. Uh, so I've seen a lot, uh, and I have to tell you, I've been waiting 20 years for a committee like this. Uh, the waiting list started in 2001, and I'm very excited to see the joint effort that's going forward 
uh, on trying to address some of these critical issues regarding services for people with disabilities. I think it's just fantastic that you guys are meeting and, and actually are committed to doing something. That is key to everything. So I provided some written testimony uh, and it is specific uh, to the workforce, uh, workforce crisis. Uh, you had mentioned the 25% increase that the uh, state legislature passed last year. Extremely grateful for that. With that 25% increase, I was able to, to increase our DSP wages, $3.50 an hour to $16 an hour. We were at $12.50. It has made a big impact for us, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, you'll see in my written testimony, uh, a year ago we had 47 uh, FTE openings, full-time equivalent openings. We are now uh, sitting at about 30. So. Uh, while we have made progress, we still have a long way to go. What I would like to provide verbally in my testimony with you is to kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, as both Nick and Matt mentioned, there are costs that are associated uh, with providing services. Uh, the vast majority of that is personnel, uh, absolutely. As far as our budget is concerned, in 2023, 88% of our funding came from Medicaid and 85% of our budget was personnel. So you can kind of see the correlation there. Now, in addition to personnel and, the, and to support the 140 individuals that we provide services for, uh, I have to build a budget that is projecting Medicaid revenue versus what we're estimating our expenses to be. Uh, one thing I can always count on every year when I work on budget is expenses rarely decrease. Uh, if we're lucky, they stay the same, uh, but that isn't always the case. Uh, I wanted to give you an idea as I'm working on our 2024 budget right now on some of the things that I'm having to factor in when I'm building a budget to keep our organization going. Personnel-related expenses, our health insurance is going to go up 7.8%. CAPERS, we are a CAPERS organization, and the CAPERS increase is 8.8%. Workers' compensation insurance is going up 6%. Background checks required. We have to do that for our license. That's going up 8%. Our drug and alcohol testing program so that we can make sure that the individuals that we serve are being provided services by individuals who are not impaired is going up 21% next year. Uh, general liability insurance, uh, property and casualty insurance, vehicle insurance, 7.6%. Um, our repair and maintenance on vehicles went up over 9% this last year. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the difficulties in finding and getting new vehicles, especially wheelchair accessible vehicles. We have several grants through KDOT that we get accessible vehicles through. We were approved for two buses in 2019. We have yet to receive them because they're just not being manufactured. Uh, we're hopeful we will get them next year, but in the meantime, we're having to keep those old buses running. Our cost increase uh, operationally. Uh, gas prices, your guess is as good as mine <laughs> going forward. And of course, utilities are going up as well. We have to keep the lights on. So without regular rate increases, the only flexibility that I have when I'm looking at our budget with increasing revenue is to either expand and serve more individuals, which with a waiting list, it's very difficult to plan on that. Plus, with uh, still having 30 openings for, uh, for staff, I can't serve more people. It just takes more people to serve them. So that's not a very good solution. The only other solution is to, re is to reduce costs. And that, what I could possibly do there is cut off admissions uh, and then not fill uh, any positions opening for, for clients to come in for services and reduce the number of, of employees that I have, which is not a good solution either, especially when we're trying to build capacity to possibly serve people off the waiting list. None of these things are good solutions. So in the last 10 years, I know Representative Haswood uh, had asked the question about how much in debt people are getting. Uh, in serving. I can tell you as an organization what, the, what has happened to us over the last 15 years. A nonprofit organization, one of the best practices that you have is to have between uh, five and six months of cash reserve. We had five months of cash reserve from 15 years ago. We're now under two, two months of reserve. So we've eaten that up. So I stand for any questions that you might have for me regarding what it takes to run an organization that supports people with disabilities. 
And like I said, I've been around a long time, so. Committee, any questions? Senator Petty. Thank you. Oh, and congratulations on your 50 years of service. You mentioned that you're, you have a 30, you're, you need to hire your 30, 30. employees short. Mm -hmm. um, and out of how many? Out of 156. And how long, uh, I mean, has this been long term or of this, the shortage of being able to find qualified staff? The workforce crisis has been, well, you know, we have never been fully staffed ever, but it really reached a crisis point for us in 2017, and that's when I did shut down admissions. Uh, we have recently reopened admissions to those people who absolutely have funding, but for six years, we didn't take anybody in. And a lot of that is, again, is because we've been able to reduce the number of openings from 50 to 30. Uh, but I've got to get additional revenue in somehow. That, that's Does very that make helpful. Sense? To, yeah, it's yeah. helpful to know that, you know, you're a provider. You have to shut down even taking any clients because, one, you don't have the staff to do that. And so, you know, if we can talk about capacity all we want, but if... If you as an employee, if you as a provider don't have the staff to provide those services, then because of one, they're not there, they're not trained, or, and two, you're not, they're not being paid adequately, so they're not even interested in the field. That really helps us when we're looking at funding. Mm -hmm. uh, I will add on that, you know, that's a thousand hours of service that we're having to fill somehow. Management, administration is filling in hours, and I have several DSPs that are working on average for the last three years over 100 hours a week. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. And yeah. they get burnt out. Yeah. I mean, who could blame them? But they also really believe in what they do, too, so. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Lori. Committee, other questions? Yes, Rep or Senator Reichman. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm really intrigued with your with your presentation, and and uh, it was interesting to you talking about the different rates, the different percentages, and whatever. I wish you would have listed those, but all businesses and everybody, every el everybody else is is fighting that same battle. What's sure. going on there? I also like the part part where you talk about the 25 percent increase in at least. You was going in a more positive thing or getting more people, okay? Uh, mine's a real basic question here. Where d does your revenue, where does it come from? What areas do you receive it, uh, revenue? Thank you. Uh, I think I mentioned 88% uh, comes from Medicaid. That's our waiver services, case management, all uh, other ancillary uh, uh, Medicaid waiver services. We see, receive about 5% from uh, the counties that we serve, that helps to fund our transportation program. They've been doing that for since before I've been at Big Lakes, so for a long time. Uh, we charge fees to our clients uh, for room and board in residential services. It helps pay for, again, rent, utilities, food, all of that. That's, uh, and then I think when you're down to that, the, then I think we have about 4% that's just miscellaneous uh, income that we receive. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, but I, was, I still see a problem when you're trying to fill in, uh, and when you're talking about Medicaid and trying to get, if 88% comes from that, and it's, I can just see it's still you're going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah, we're heavily dependent, there's no doubt. No doubt. And that's what makes us a little different than a lot of Medicaid providers um, when, with waiver services versus med medical. Uh, you have hospitals and, and a doctor's office and so forth that accept Medicaid, but that's, you know, about this much of their business, while the rest they get through private insurance or, or whatever. We are totally dependent on Medicaid for service dollars. But there's no actually s state money goes directly to you guys then. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. You bet. Committee, other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you very much. And next we'll call to the podium Doug Wisby from my neck of the woods. Welcome, Doug. 
Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, my name is Doug Wisby. I'm with MCDS and McPherson. Uh, like Lori, I've been around for a while. Um, it'll be 20 years for me here this year. Um, a lot of my testimony sounds a lot like Lori's did. Um, we're about 15 heads short. Uh, we have about 75 employees. We should be in the 90 range. Um, one of the things I did want to talk to you about is, um, first of all, thank you so much for the increase last year. It was uh, a real godsend for us. We were in dire straits, and, uh, and it's been very beneficial. We've raised our starting wage from $13 an hour to $17 an hour. Um, we did not apply as much of the increase towards our benefit package as some of the other providers did, and that a lot of times uh, explains why some are lower rates than we are. Um, when we looked at that, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would encourage people at the entry level to come to work for us, and um, typically that's starting wage. Um, a lot of the folks that we employ that are DSPs are in the 18 to 25 range, uh, still on their parents' insurance. Um, they're young and bulletproof, so typically the starting wage is a lot more important to them than benefits. Uh, where the rubber meets the road for us uh, when it comes to benefits is our ability to hire people at the managerial level and above. And so a lot of the difficulties that we have currently are not only the DSP folks, but also the managerial folks, um, the professional folks, the accountants, the HR people, payroll, IT, that sort of thing. What I want to talk to you a little bit about today is um, our industry is such that we have received periodic rate increases over the years. They kind of come and go. Uh, but the problem is it makes managing our businesses very difficult to do. As Lori talked to you all about, when it comes to trying to budget for our businesses, uh, trying to attract, uh, hire, and retain good people, um, we need to have some idea of what our revenue streams are going to look like. And when you get periodic rate increases that you don't know when they're going to be when they're going to show up or how much they're going to be, it makes that process very difficult for us to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're probably uh, at least 15 heads short, even with the new rates and uh, the monies that we've applied towards our benefits packages. What I would encourage you all to consider is a formal process for evaluating our rates on at least a every two-year process. As Matt mentioned earlier, there is something built in the DDRA that that calls for that. Um, it's, I think, been a mixed bag over the years, even the years we've done it. Part of the problem that people have when it comes to doing this is trying to establish what our base DSP rates should be from a pay and benefits standpoint. Um, as he mentioned also, there's some movement on the national level to try to come up with a wage class for DSPs, which I think would be tremendously beneficial for rate studies going forward but I would encourage the state to go ahead and reinstitute that process and come up with some formal process to take a look at what our rates are, uh, at least on an every two-year basis. And that's all I have, and I would certainly answer any questions you might have. Committee, what questions do we have for Doug? Uh, Senator Petty. Thank you. Um, so, Doug, uh, thanks for your presentation. So there is or there is not a uh, national rate? There is not. Um, Matt could probably give you a little bit better information than I can. I think it got out of committee, but there's been a push at the national level to try to come up with uh, a wage class for DSPs. And I think that's been the problem in a lot of cases with the rate studies over the years is they haven't really been able to establish what that should be. And that would really be beneficial, in my opinion, from doing those rate studies going forward. So I'm hoping very much it passes. So okay, Thanks. Representative Bueller. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just curious, the, the previous speaker talked about where her funding came from. Are, is, is your sources of revenue, are they the same, or could you yeah. expand on that a little bit? Very similar. Um, the majority of our money comes from Medicaid-eligible folks who receive services through the IDD waiver, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you characterize that percentage off the top of your head? Ooh, close to 100. Really? We have very few private pay. Committee, other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Doug. Next, I would call Kevin Fish from Ability Point. Oh, 
Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair and committee, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you today. Um, I'm Kevin Fish with Ability Point. We serve Sedgwick and Butler counties and uh, do that through a variety of, of programs and services, but most of those are not HCBS funded. We are one of the largest targeted case management providers in the state, and that's one of the things I really wanted to stress today because we feel like it's really important that, that it's included in this rate study. First, I wanted to say thank you um, for the last several sessions. Many of you guys have championed a lot of improvements for the IDD system. We've talked about the rate increases and focusing on the waiting list, <clears throat> but also talking about the need for this, uh, an ongoing way that we could really address the rate concerns we have in the state. Um, with TCM not being an HCBS funded service, it's not only funded differently, but it's also billed differently. And because of that, not everything a case manager does is a billable activity. There's a lot of things that they are required to provide, uh, you know, assessing the needs of the individual, creating a plan, monitoring services. But when it comes down to how you do that, there's a lot of things, transportation, for exa example, being able to get out and see the individual, um, putting together the, uh, and reviewing the files, um, doing ongoing trainings that are required for our staff to make sure that they're up on what the needs are, what the resources are for our families. So there's a lot of things that are not billable activities. Uh, what we hear is about 65 to 70 percent of the time of a case manager is actually a bill, billable activity. And so because of that, there's a lot of costs that uh, go into the operation that is not being recouped. Um, you heard a lot about staff turnover. Uh, a new TCM, it may take them two months before they're able to actually uh, have a full caseload and begin to really even bill near that 60, 70 percent target. Um, we have a lot of costs. You know, we talk about going out and putting together those plans, the transportation to get there. Again, it's not a billable activity, but it's cost to the provider. When we get there, we may need to provide an interpreter. Again, it's a cost to the provider, um, the cost of doing business. Um, we have to have the software to be able to process, enter the notes, uh, create a plan uh, to be able to, to submit the billing. Again, ongoing cost of doing business. Um, and we've heard about everybody else saying our costs are going up, workman's comp is going up, our liability insurance is going up, um, just keeping the lights on, everything. The costs keep climbing, and so we need to make sure that we are taking care of those. Uh, with our organizations, we've got a lot of support staff that are crucial in order for us to do what we do. Our director of TCM is the one who does the intakes, who assigns those does uh, trainings with the staff who are going out and shadowing in positions. Our TCM supervisor, again, helping to make sure our case managers have the supports they need, overseeing our behavior management committee, all important roles. And again, not something that they are able to bill for. And so it's a cost of us doing business. And so, again, as we do these rate studies, we want to make sure that all of those things are included. And we want to make sure that everything IDD is related uh, is included in this. Again, TCM being tied into this. And remembering that break even is not good business. Um, we as providers need to be able to grow our organizations. Uh, we need to be able to reinvest in those benefits, in those staff, to make sure that we're able to keep them um, as, as the future grows. We hear a lot about capacity. We know there's a lot of people who are currently on a waiting list who have yet to even come into services, but we also know there's thousands more who have yet to even apply. In Sedgwick County alone, uh, statistically, there's over 5,200 individuals who would have a developmental disability. There are 2,600 that are currently being served in the IDD system, and of that, 1,000 of those are on the waiting list. So there are thousands that we're still waiting to see come into our service system. So we have to have our capacity in place. When those families need us, we can be there. One of the few resources a family has while they're on the waiting list is a case manager. So we know how important this can be in supporting those families. So uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to put this together, to really um, earmark this as, as a crucial need. Uh, we thank you for your time and I'll take any other questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. And are there other questions, committee? Senator Petty. Didn't push that button all the way. Um, when earlier we were talking about, or we looked at the community, the community 
support waiver uh, proposal that would have to be approved by CMS. And so uh, from the information that you've provided, when we're looking at that community, what is proposed with the community support waiver are the, that you mentioned like a lot of, of the things that are not billable activities right now, would that change with under that community support No, waiver? I don't think the community support waiver would impact any of that. Um, before we went to incremental billing, we started doing counter billing with TCM, which was more encompassing of all the different things that a case manager sort of, sort of does. Uh, we definitely think the, the, uh, the new waiver, the support waiver would be tremendous because, you know, we serve hundreds of people um, that are on that waiting list. So that would be a blessing. Okay, thanks. Committee, other questions? Thank you so much, Kevin. Committee, thank you. For, um, you saw I had an absence there for a few moments. I appreciate Vice Chair uh, Mason taking over. I took a call from the Deputy Director of Missouri's Medicaid program, Kirk Matthews. Um, we were texting back and forth, and I said, let's just talk. And so he is going to get me some answers this afternoon about how long uh, it, the waiver took them to get and maybe they could help that, us to kind of speed that along. I asked about the 28,000 um, and how many of them reached the cap and if they did a per person or an aggregate and he's checking on that. And then any conditions or any concerns that they had that could just help us as we're walking through this process that they would say, caution, I wish we would have done it like this or here's some current concerns. So I hope to be able to report that back to you this afternoon. And now we're going to move on to Colleen Hemmelberg with uh, Cottonwood. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is still morning. Um, I'm Colleen Himmelberg with Cottonwood Incorporated. We serve Douglas County and uh, Jefferson County. Um, we are located in Lawrence. We just celebrated, like Lori, our 50th anniversary last year. I'm embarking upon my second year at Cottonwood as the CEO, as well as in the state of Kansas. So I don't have a lot of the history and the statistics um, that most of you and, and many of my colleagues have. But as you can see in my testimony, coming in as a new CEO um, and trying to forecast, trying to look at how to plan, how to prepare for the future, um, one of the biggest things obviously is revenue and how do you balance revenue with expenses. Any of you that have worked in business or own your own business certainly know the, the challenges of that and many of my colleagues obviously alluded to that. but. Um, a, a big portion of our revenue um, certainly is the Medicaid HCBS funding for, for services. We are very fortunate. Uh, we also have a work center in which we have a federal contract through um, the Ability One Commission. And so we have a pretty good portion, probably 20% um, of our revenue um, is diversified into actually production. Um, and those are some of the areas that we are embarking upon increasing in order to um, diversify the funding and have less reliance on HCBS. But let's be real. That is truly the bulk um, and certainly the revenue for the services um, that we provide. We have a strong foundation, as do all of my colleagues in the room. So fundraising also um, is a portion um, certainly of our bottom line. And we're all investing in doing more of that um, as well to diversify and bring that revenue. So I, I think that what I want to say to you is that we as organizations working together with Interhab, partnering together, are working to diversify our revenue and do, to do our part um, to analyze, save those expenses and be positioned um, appropriately for the future and um, to, to, you know, certainly balance out that bottom line. Um, so we definitely, definitely um, are doing our part. I moved here from Missouri, um, so have been um, certainly part of working together with Mercer, working with the Department of Mental Health in um, doing that rate study and figuring out how we make it happen on an annual basis. It's complex, don't get me wrong. And getting the SOC code, the standard operational code, out of the federal government will be key. It will be key nationwide, just you know, across the United States and be a basis for all of us, for every state. 
um, to be able to base what those rates should look like. But doing the rate study really gives us the bottom line data, right? It tells us what that position, you know, what the value is in the market and what we need to be looking at in order to stay competitive in the market. So I believe it's a very fair way to analyze that we're not coming to you saying well, it's $25 an hour when it, when it truly isn't. Um, so it's a very fair way and I think a smart business way to analyze and make sure that that, that is happening. So much has changed since 2016 when the last rate study um, was, was, was um, conducted. It was nine years or seven years ago. So much has changed. So I really, really want to encourage us as a state to embark upon that process um, and really be able to kind of hardwire what that basis looks like going forward. Questions? Committee, do we have questions before our last conferee? Seeing none, thank you so much, you. Colleen, for being here, and congratulations to your 50 years as well. Not you personally, but Cottonwood. Um, Rachel Newman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Somehow I always draw the short straw, and I'm the one standing between you guys and the door or lunch, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so my name is Rachel Newman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of COF Training Services. We, we support 300 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in East Central Kansas. I'm here today because the future of this field not only affects my career, but it also affects my entire life. I'm the primary caregiver of a sister with autism and co-occurring mental health disorders. While I'm personally committed to supporting her with all that I have for as long as I can, her hopes and dreams for her life exceed the home I am able to share with her. She hopes for a long-term career she wants to live on her own and create a life that enhances her personal goals and not just mine. I know that she can only do this. Um, I know that she can only do this with a stable support system that exceeds just me. Um, I appreciate all of you for stepping in and saving uh, the IDD service system in the final hour. I say that because that 25% rate increase truly did that. Without that rate increase, we, wouldn't, we would be having a different conversation today. We'd be talking about all of the providers that have closed down in the past years, how many individuals who have funding are going without services, and how many months we might have left until there's no system left to save. So for, for saving that, I thank you. Instead, we're here today talk and I'm asking you to consider helping us to never get to that conversation because we got way too close. I've worked for COF for 10 years, beginning as a direct support professional. Um, I have spent the majority of my career in an administrative administrative role within my agency. Over the years without rate increases, we've engaged in numerous discussions to make the next small cut to hopefully not, um, not kill the body. Uh, in order to prevent cutting direct care wages, we've had to reduce our PTO, other benefits, transportation funds, maintenance of our building, quality assurance systems, out of agency training, and too much more. We've had to eliminate not essential services and close services that couldn't be financially independent outside of our primary services. Um, on that list, TCM was next, and because of you guys in the recent investment, we're hoping to not have to eliminate that service. When we received the 25% rate increase, there was a need to reinvest in all those areas that we had recently cut budgets, but we had to prioritize direct care wages, and we increased direct care wages by $4 an hour using 100% of that rate increase we received. This helped, and we're much now, now much more stable than we were. Um, in 2018, we closed our doors for new service recipients. Our goal was to get to a fully staffed position and open up. We wanted to be fully staffed for six months before we can open up. We've never been fully staffed since. We've also strategically reduced the size of our agency. Uh, in 2018, we had 57 of 175 positions, 57% of 175 positions open. Um, now, we have 18% of 155 positions open, so we've reduced our need by 20 percent um, or 20 positions. We've done that by natural attrition. We closed our doors. We've had individuals that have aged and have passed or left services voluntarily. Um, as the COO of my agency, I'm still covering an average of 15 hours a week of direct care services. Make no mistake, I love direct care. That's why I'm here. Uh, but that does pull me away from my other critical duties, and it, it, it definitely is a, a challenge for us to manage. 
We just finalized our budget for the next fiscal year. Um, by keeping our budget the same as last year, we would have had to budget at a loss. So instead, we had to, again, go through and cut out which priorities weren't such a priority. Those budget cuts might seem minor, but they aren't, and they affect the lives of the staff and the individuals we serve. I'm here as a professional, but I'm also here as a human working in the field, so I'm going to share a little bit of hum my humanity with you. This year, my son's father uh, suddenly died. I needed, to take off, uh, I needed to take some time off of work with my son, but I was unable to do so because the same week my mother-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I had to save my PTO so I could provide support to her. Um, within a month, she was terminal and at risk of going into a nursing home. So that was the time that I was able to prioritize staying home and taking care of her. While I was taking care of her, I had to consider that I wanted her to be around for her granddaughter and children's lives, and I hoped she lived, but I also didn't have much PTO left to stay for if she lived much longer. Sadly, she only lived three weeks in my care, and she passed away. I truly needed more time with my family to heal through that, but I did, was out of PTO and I had to go back to work. Um, that's because we had to cut our PTO budget. My first week back, I worked an overnight shift, two other direct care positions, and I also had to perform CPR on a p person that I've cared for for many years for 23 minutes after she had a sudden stroke. She luckily didn't die from the stroke initially, and we were able to keep her alive, but unfortunately the damage was too great and she didn't live long. I'm embarrassed to say that as someone who's committed to the field, that was not the first time I heavily considered leaving the field, and it sadly won't be the last. But I'm still here today, and I'm still fighting because I want to work my life in this field, and I want to see a field here when my children are grown and when I'm gone. In order to do that, we're going to need to invest in the long-term stability of this field. Um, and by doing that, we're going to have to look at that rate regularly and never get to a point that we were when, when our field was on the brink of collapse. Um, like I said, we're closed for service referrals. We've been closed um, for since 2017 now and unfortunately still not ready to open back up. Um, in addition to that one um, individual that we lost, we lost three other in the past two months. Um, with those four individuals, unfortunately I'm still as a caregiver mourning their loss and I also have to as the administrator consider the fiscal impact on my agency. With those four individuals we've lost $400,000 of funding. Simple solution, open your doors back up, but we can't do that because we haven't met our capacity building plan of being fully staffed and we also have the risk of opening up to additional complex needs individuals. Our agency cares very much about individuals who have complex needs and we still serve them. We have many individuals we serve 24 hour one-on-one -on -one support to that cost us a minimum of $250,000 a year and upwards of $600,000 a year for one person. Um, so we have to prioritize the, the whole in, uh, agency and by opening back up, we're putting ourselves at risk of more individuals of that service. Um, we also have a lot of increased costs in our services. Um, with the final rule that we're dealing with right now, um, we're trying to get out in the community, but oftentimes our, our staffing ratios are two to one, one to one, depending on the service industry that we're doing. We have a medically complex population. We currently do 60 on average appointments a week for our 190 individuals that we run appointments for. Many of those are specialist appointments and take up to four hours because of the drive time. Um, so I could go through a lot of numbers, uh, but I'm not gonna do that. My goal here today is to hope that you guys understand the need to invest long term in our system and I appreciate your time and we'll stand for questions at the given time. Rachel, thank you so much and committee, are there any questions for Rachel? Yeah. Um, Representative or uh, Senator Billinger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no question. Just thank you. You've got a great heart like thousands of others in this system and if it wasn't for people like you, we would be in I don't know where we'd be, but it would be dire. Thank you. Thank you. And I would echo that statement. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you for all of our conferees this morning. I would like to thank Interhab for providing our working lunch. Committee, we will have lunch. If you could bring it that back in here, we will uh, reconvene at 1230.
on how many things are on the fire. Right, right. Yes. How about you? Yeah, I don't know. I have
Committee, we are ready to begin. Earlier in the day, I mentioned that we were not going to be here tomorrow because we feel like we can finish all of our business and our testimonies today. So just again, reminder of that. And so we're going to go until we finish our recommendations today. And um, committee, I appreciate your attention. We're going to begin with Michael Fitzpatrick, and it's because Michael is uh, one of the providers. And then we'll move on to the um, other uh, testimonies. Michael, you're on WebEx, is that right? Correct. Did you say correct? Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine now. Uh, thank you, and please continue. All right. Well, first, thank you for taking the time to serve on this committee, and I'd like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues who have expressed in great depth uh, the need for this special hearing today, so I greatly appreciate that. My name is Michael and I serve as class president uh, and CEO. We are located in southeastern Kansas and serve five different areas across four different counties. So we serve Cherokee, Crawford, Labette, and Montgomery and uh, serve approximately 300 clients uh, with 167 to 175 staff, depending on the day, of, the minute of the day, actually, at various times. Uh, I have just passed my one year anniversary here at class, and we are approaching our 50th anniversary serving this southeastern Kansas population. When I arrived a year ago, my predecessor, Scott Thompson, informed me all about uh, things related to class and more specifically the wait list. At that time, there were about 3,900 individuals on the wait list in the state of Kansas and about 250 plus or minus in this southeastern Kansas population center. Uh, currently Michael. Yes. Michael, if you can hear me, it's Senator Gossage again. Uh, you, I don't know that you were on this morning when I mentioned that it would be five minutes and then we'll have time for questions. You will not be able to hear the little alarm as it goes off. So I will remind you when it's been five minutes and you're not using this time while I'm talking. Oh, so okay. please go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I, hopefully I'll get this done in the next two. Uh, so essentially what I'm sharing is that the wait list is now at 5,000. As many of my colleagues have expressed, we are at capacity as well because of the staffing crisis. And to my current understanding, the way that the IDD waiver rates are calculated, a large part of that is the assessment model that focuses on behavior as well as the medical fragility and or complex health needs of our consumers. From that perspective, when a client's managed behaviors are in check and we're not saying these behaviors are still existing because we are doing the managing of the behaviors, their tier rates inevitably change, for example, from a tier one or tier two to tier one, and thus a decrease in funding. But the cost associated with that staffing model and maintaining those behaviors are still in play and we are losing fiscally hand over fist or hemorrhaging money if we want to use it just more bluntly. One of the things that we've noted in our letter were five different prongs of how I would recommend and my leadership team would recommend the state of Kansas look at this holistically and reassessing every two years to ensure that we maintain the cost of living as well as the hyperinflation and all the other systemic issues associated with the field of our uh, basically staffing prices. What we do is critical. We work with the most vulnerable of populations, and maintaining employment is oftentimes very difficult. As my colleague mentioned right before the lunch break, uh, lost numerous clients in the last two to three months. Since I've been here this year, we've lost five clients uh, due to agility, health, complex health care needs. And we cannot open up capacity because of those staffing crisis issues as well. So I really do appreciate your time today and letting me know I had five minutes uh, for this session and would be willing to serve on any reconstruction or re, um, revamping committee that you may seem uh, deem appropriate. And I'll stand for any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Michael. And committee, do we have questions? Seeing none, thank you. We're going to now move to Sarah Hart Weir. Executive Director of KCDD. Welcome, Sarah. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, and members of the committee. Um, as the Senator pointed out, I'm Sarah Hart. We are on the Executive Director of the Kansas Council on Developmental Disabilities. First of all, thank you so much for convening today's special committee for the ongoing work from last year. Representative Carpenter and I were just talking about some of the outcomes of this session last fall, as well as the rate increase. Um, we certainly appreciate your hard work and all of your advocacy. Um, as we sit here today, Kansans with intellectual and developmental disabilities, our Kansans families, and our state caregivers are faced with an ongoing crisis in our state related to directly to what we call the three W's, our Kansas waiver, our Kansas workforce, and our wages. Uh, we recognize that the scope of today's hearing is focused on the rate needs of the IDD community. Thus, we wanted to elevate the following three important items that we feel will drastically impact the quality of life for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, tackle the workforce crisis in our state, and significantly improve the delivery of supports and services by ensuring rate parity among day service and supported employment. Um, regarding the need to offer Kansans and Kansas families more flexibility and choice in our current system, um, we wanted to highlight two important measures that we think would drastically improve the current um, system. First, and we talked about this last fall, We'd like to see the formal adoption of independent budget authority um, for Kansans with IDD utilizing waiver services. Through the implementation of IBA, increased flexibility would be provided to waiver participants, allowing more opportunities for self-direction to fund um, personalized supports and services. The next, and this is certainly a conversation that is happening all around the country, and that is to utilize the, um, the option for paid family caregivers. Um, several states like Connecticut, Colorado, Maine, Minnesota have already made significant strides to utilize paid family caregiving through state waiver, uh, waiver systems. We strongly encourage and suggest that Kansas expand the scope of our IDD waiver services to allow for this option. Um, we feel strongly that there would be little cost to the state of Kansas to adopt this option for our families. Um, the second is to ensure rate parity for Kansans with IDD to access supported employment um, and day services. This means modernizing our IDD waiver to ensure that there is rate parity among those who choose to self-direct their services, um, typically accessing one-on-one -on -one supports to those who um, choose to um, opt into a provider agency, which typically have three to one staff ratios. In addition to the rate parity among those ratios, we also um, recommend a modest increase in the reimbursement rate for supported employment to be increased to $50 an hour. This just creates another incentive in our reimbursement structure for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to access what we like to call competitive integrated employment. And it really creates a new incentive for providers to invest in programs in CEI. The final thing um, or the final component to this is really making short-term investments in how we address um, the crisis we see in our overall workforce, which we spent a lot of time talking about this morning. Um, our IDD community is facing a myriad of challenges with high staff turnover rates, consistent and long vacancies, which we heard a lot about this morning, very low state reimbursement rates that really result in low wages and quality of our DS. SPs. We highlighted in our testimony um, just a few models that are being successful in other parts of the country. Um, one in Ohio where they've increased um, wages by just one dollar for workers who complete 60 hours of eligible competency training and work for at least two years in the DSP field. 
Another is in the state of Tennessee, where we've seen a lot of innovation happening in their waiver system, where they've developed a value-based purchasing initiative to promote quality in LTSS that incorporates a comprehensive career ladder and education system for DSPs. And then finally, and this is something that our council is going to make significant investments in the coming months, and that is to provide and encourage more um, health equity and health outcomes work related to the IDD community. And this is around encouraging more inclusive IDD training for our entire Kansas healthcare community. I was just talking to an advocate here um, during the break about how their um, son, who's an adult with a disability, accesses their own primary care physician for their care. We want more inclusivity in our health care system for individuals with IDD. Thank you again for allowing the council to provide some comments, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Committee, do we have questions for Sarah? Yes, um, Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sarah, thank you for being here. Um, so could you just kind of walk a lay person like myself through the supported employment and what we're talking about to provide that service. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of different options um, for individuals with the IDD to pursue supported employment. What we'd like to see is providers to have more resources to provide that one-on-one -on -one supports. So individuals with intellectual disabilities have options to pursue employment in the community. And that comes with a little bit more supports and one-on-one -on -one, uh, customized employment job coaching and making sure that that employment setting is right for the individual just as it is as much as it is for the employer and to create that customized job supports is truly important then rather than you know what we typically have heard about enclaves or sheltered workshops that are typically have higher staff to employee ratios So follow up, we reimburse uh, 1447 15 uh, for 15 minutes, so that's 16 17 dollars an hour. So what would a provider incur as way? I think this is why we don't have more people that do supported employment because it, they just don't get reimbursed enough to. So what would that involve for them? What would they be providing for that? Seventeen dollars an hour. That's and I think that's a great question for the advocacy community and the providers to work together to come on, come up with what that plan would entail to create those incentives. We're not a provider organization, so it's hard for me to kind of put pen to paper on what that would look like. But I know, and I don't want to call on anybody, but I've had the opportunity to tour and visit uh, supported employment program at Cottonwood. And I know Colleen probably can speak to exactly those numbers and the success that they're having in the Douglas County, Lawrence area, because they're really creating new incentives for individuals with IDD to access employment in the community. And they have the employer network, which is just as important, where their success rates are really, really high. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Sarah committee? I have one, Sarah. So I knew that Cottonwood was doing this, but I guess the question is Cottonwood is doing this under our current situation. And so why is it that you guys couldn't do this under the current situation? So that's really not the purpose of the council. Ours is really to provide statewide uh, systems change and advocacy to open up more opportunities. Employment, housing, transportation are all localized um, solutions to solve our unemployment crisis for individuals with intellectual disabilities all across the state. I can say, um, living in um, the Overland Park Johnson Care County area, there are some really great models mm -hmm. of organizations and nonprofits that are coming online outside of the provider system. Um, two examples that I would point out, or three actually, um, in your area, Senator, um, Inclusion Connections in Olathe has created their own nonprofit job placement system outside of the current kind of system within Kansas. I was just there on Friday with our state treasurer, Golden Scoop. I'm sure many of you have read about their um, incredible employment program, which um, creates a business model for individuals with disabilities to work in a coffee shop and an ice cream shop. And then um, a typical 
um, kind of affiliate of the Down syndrome community, Down syndrome innovations actually has their own employment program. So they are not reimbursing for mm -hmm. services. All three of those organizations, they're kind of doing it outside of the traditional typical model. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for being here, Sarah. I appreciate you. you. Next, we will have Colin um, Olenek. Did I say that right? I always get his last name wrong. Is it Olenek? Uh, Olenek? Close enough. Close, but I want to know what it is exactly. Olenek. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, here. It's Olen, Olenek. Olenek. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Thank you so much. Okay, my name is Colin Olenek. And I am the legislative liaison for the Self Advocacy Coalition Kansas. I was um, I'm here today to talk about talk about the community supports waiver, and that's coming online. And uh, our main thing as advocates is we want budget authority throughout the new waiver. Uh, that way. People can choose what services they need. As we've heard, not everyone chooses every service on the or needs every service on the comprehensive waiver. Uh, we we think, and from other states such as Missouri, uh, families can tailor their services to what they need and. Bets are that that'll be less than uh, having them on the fully comprehensive waiver. Um, and I know there's been a lot of talk about timeline and having this thing come up in 2026 and such. And y you could technically do it with state general funds right now if you wanted to. I mean, it would probably be less than what the feds would provide through a waiver, but if you wanted to, you could do it with just state general funds for right now uh, and such. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Do we have any questions for Colin today? Yeah. Seeing none, thank you so much for being here. Uh. Next, we have Laura Kozesik. And I see we have Grant here as well. Would you like to both come forward? Sure. Very fine. Hello, my name is Grant Kozacek. I'm 17 years old, and I have a brother named Jackson Kozacek who has a form of autism. He's always been an amazing brother to me, but today I'd like to highlight a little portion of the impact that he's had on my life, theater. When I was in third grade, I watched my brother put on a production of The Jungle Book at the Jewish Community Center of Greater Kansas City, and that changed my life so much. I ended up joining theater and in turn joined debate, and this year, the topic resolution for debate is about fiscal redistribution. So as soon as I heard that topic, I knew that I wanted to have an impact that tied closely to my brothers, and that's why I'm here today, because of the research I've done on Social Security, Disability Income, and Medicaid. So when my mom got to speak here today, I just knew I had to join in, and that's why we're going to focus on four main points. Social Security, Disability Income, and I know that is a federal program, but it's still ties closely into Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid failing to help in crucial, crucial areas, costing families, the problems with Medicaid relating to group homes and day programs, and the impact that has on homelessness and poverty. So first, Social Security Disability Income. A single adult in Kansas needs about $27,378 in order to live just above the poverty line. And currently, for example, my brother gets around $900 a month from Social Security Disability Income. He gets $10,800 a year from this income, leaving him $16,578 below the poverty line. He does not have enough money to provide for himself, often relying on my mom to fill in that gap. 
And if a child with a disability tries to take up a job in, in order to close that gap, they're just punished even further by Social Security. They're taking away benefits because they have these jobs. Therefore, they're punished for holding a job that they are just trying to get to support themselves. All in all, Social Security is not adequately providing income for people with disabilities, worsening the impacts of the flawed Medicaid system. So Medicaid now. The impacts that Medicaid has, there is an impact with family income as well from the flaws of Medicaid. So when a child with a disability ages out of the school system, public schools, it puts a burden on the families then. The families are then required to find assistance, enroll their child in a day program, or be accountable 24-7. While Medicaid will pay for some of these services, and I'll touch on this later, it is often up to the families to find the needed care or program for their children. And if the child is enrolled in a day program, it often requires then transportation, which currently Medicaid does not provide, requiring families to lose jobs just in order to get their child to a program that they so desperately need. This takes away the family's income because they don't have access to the needed resources that should be provided to them just to get transportation to and from services. So about those services, group homes and day programs. While group homes can be paid by Medicaid, their reimbursement is so low that it doesn't provide adequate support. For example, group homes often have to pay for food via food stamps because their reimbursement doesn't cover all of these costs. With my parents looking for possible day programs for my brother, many programs would be a perfect match, but since they don't accept Medicaid because the reimbursement is so low, we have to take them off the list. This further proves the need for funding for these programs and even more aspects, which my mom will touch on. But together, these all push the ableist mindset that is in place today on um, poverty and homelessness, saying that no matter what these people do, they're forced to live on programs that are meant for the impoverished or completely homeless unless they live on their parents' income for the rest of their lives. This is why 12.3% of the homeless population has a disability because of the inability to provide for themselves and the inability to support them by these programs. So while I might be debating over hypothetical topics, this is real life and you guys have the power to change stuff. So while normally I only get a gold medal, this would mean a win for the world and all the over 500,000 people who rely on Medicaid in Kansas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom. You must be very proud of this young man. Um, and Laura, do you have a separate testimony we can offer questions when you're finished? You're both finished. Yes. So he's talked. He's talked on the on the um, on the day program part. I actually want to add to that. So again, our son has a lot of medical challenges. He has tumors on most of his major organs. Um, and he requires specialty care. Ironically, in the state of Kansas, there is no one that can provide that care for us, and we've had to go outside of Kansas. The good news is he's still under my coverage, so I can get that care for him. But as soon as he ages out, we're gonna be required to pay all of his services out of pocket. So we have a lot of patients, or a lot of dependents, who are gonna lose access to that care. So for us, we have a child who has tumors on his brain, his heart, his kidneys, his eyes, his face. He has seizures, he has behavioral challenges, he's developmentally challenged, and he's got all these meds and all these providers who need to care for him, and we're not the only ones in that situation. So again, I, I know there's no reciprocity across most states for Medicaid, but that's one of the things I would ask that we start looking at. And we also look at how much we're paying providers. I've also worked on the provider side, so I know what that looks like, and it's a great challenge. I, I could have a whole nother topic of conversation on that. Um, the other thing I want to bring to your attention is residential care. So 17 years old, we're getting ready for college. He's so excited to live in a dorm or live with his friends. So guess what? Brother wants to do the same. Guess what? Brother's not going to be able to do the same. He's developmentally six. He, he can't live on his own. He's epileptic. Uh, he needs help cutting his food. He still cuts his hamburgers in half. And he uh, needs help with the hyg self hygiene. He, there's a lot of things he can't do for himself, so he needs care. So going into these residential homes, you've got one caregiver for four to five other kids. So what happens when there's a behavioral challenge or a health challenge, and you have one caregiver and four or five kids? There's some safety issue concerns in that also. Um, one of the things that a lot of parents have talked about is we'd love for our our um, kids on the IDD waiver to live in a situation similar to what Grant's going to get to do 
in a dorm type setting, if we could look at some alternatives of care that we could potentially model, um, we could potentially have fewer people that need to care for these people, but at the same time they have, they can work in their homes, they can have their friends with them, and they can live what I would consider a typical life. Right now I think the state of Kansas looks, looks at that as being institutionalized. As a parent, I don't. I look at that as an opportunity to live independent. So again, lots of challenges between day programs, transportation for day programs, which honestly, I'm probably gonna be looking at having to do an early retirement just to provide Jackson transportation to these day programs or to his work site because there is no transportation available. And the little bit of transportation that we could do for a work program is public transportation. He's developmentally six, and I know none of you would put your six-year-old six in public transportation. So we really do need to look at what are some alternatives for care, whether it be for medical care and reciprocity across states, for day programs, or as Sarah mentioned, can we do something where they have a caretaker, or even a couple of kids together have a caretaker and go to a job together and become, um, can be a citizen in, this, in the community and actually provide services in the community. Um, Jackson, as I look at him today, he works at the Jewish Community Center, but it's through a, a job program through the school. And so he's got a job coach. He, he takes care of the dirty towels. He washes them, he picks them up, he, wa he wipes down tables, he vacuums, and everybody loves to see him. He's a greeter. <laughs> so, I mean, think about the things that our, our kids can do. If, if all they can do is bring a smile to someone's face, that's, that's worth a, a thousand words right there. So. Please take a look at the alternatives of how can we care for our, parent, our, our kids differently, but also making sure we have the right resources and, and what the families need. So the, that's what, what I would ask. So questions? Um, questions for either Laura or Grant. Committee? Thank you. Um, I just, well, let me just say thank you so much for being here and um, I know that it's very difficult to have someone in the family that's, I know many families just like this um, that have worked at that. And I thank you so much for your testimonies. Um, and I do have a question regarding this for our commissioner, I think, who is still in the room. Would you mind coming back to the uh, microphone for a moment, commissioner? Thank you, Grant and Laura. Could you just address a couple of things that were brought up? If a, pers if a uh, person who's on Medicaid does not have uh, the ability to go to anyone who can address their medical needs in the state of Kansas, does Medicaid cover them to go to another state? Um, under managed care, the, the managed care agencies can contract outside of Kansas if they don't have uh, services within, that was uh, my understanding. within the state. That's so correct. if the services are not here, the, the MCO can contract outside. And they do, yes. And they do, okay, can Lara. I, can I add to that? Sure. sure. So I actually work for an MCO right now from, for on, on the, it's not on the Medicaid side, okay. but I prior, prior to that I came from the physician side of things and a hospital setting. So yes, we were able to contract on behalf. The problem is, is that, so when a, a, a patient needs to go say to, we're looking at either WashU or Colorado. The process is you already have your Medicaid through your current state. Mm -hmm. They then have to apply for Medicaid in the state of Kansas. After they've done that and they get approved, then they go to the MCO and they have to go through a process of one, an application, two, they have to be credentialed by that, provide, by, by that payer, and then three, they have to do a contract. And I can tell you that the contracts are not just sign it and go. They're a very timely process. They can take months. Um, that, that's what I do for a living, is I do contracting. Um, and I've had a cred credentialing tied to me also. So it's oftentimes we would forego the reimbursement, especially in emergency settings, because it wasn't worth what we would get paid, especially because you have to credential the facility and every single practitioner that ties back to that patient. So it's, it's, not, a simple, it's not as simple as, yes, we will approve it, because there's a lot of steps that have to be incurred and it's very timely. And the MCO that your son is with, do you know, have you reached out to them about contracting with this provider that's out of state? Ironically, I work for the same company in a different division. <laughs> so yes, I am in the process of doing that as we speak. Good. Um, right now he will be covered through my insurance. Yes. 
But again, as he ages, that could change. He'll go to that at MCO. He'll go through that Correct. MCO then. And then as, as I look at day out. programs, even the day programs, some of them will not contract with all the MCOs based upon all the hoops that are ha they have to right. jump through. And so you've and got- And sometimes they don't, it, it's an unusual situation. So they don't have to contract with every MCO. They need to contract with one because the individual can change over to that MCO correct. if there's a situation like that. That is correct. Okay. There's uh -huh. challenges with that too. In our situation, again, you've got medication challenges. So now you have to jump through hoops to get approval for the medications we're on, for the physicians that we go to. And if you shift, if you shift now and you're going out of state for care, now there's a whole new contracting process. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very simple- It never is. No. No, it really is. Even isn't. in the private sector, it <laughs> never is. But thank you. I'm glad that you understand that. Um, and please stay there. So, another question that I have for you, um, um, for our, for them, would be if, if you are, there was something else that you mentioned now that has escaped me. Oh, transportation. Mm -hmm. So, if he's with a private payer now um, and he ages out and he goes through Medicaid, then will he be able to have transportation to go to the doctor for services? So transportation right now uh, under our contract is, is for the doc, going to the doctor, going to the dentist, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It is not covered to go to a, a waiver ser to a day service. Or, um, so it's just for medical appointments. For medical I, appointments, but right. not for day services. And let me, let me add to that again. Go ahead. He's, he's developmentally six. Would any of y'all send your six-year-old to the doctor by himself? <laughs> no, and I understand that. It's just that it was brought up in, right. like in Grant's testimony, and maybe you said there's no transportation available, and I'm like... It, there's transportation for medical care, uh -huh. the trans, and there, there could be transportation for a child who works if there's an available spot, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. However, if you're going to a day program, there is no transportation available because they're not going to work. What it doesn't take into account is that if I work full time, the day programs are from nine to three. Now I'm not able to tra transport my child at nine o'clock in the morning, get mm -hmm. back to my office at 9.30 and by 2.15, I get to go pick him back up because they're done at three. Mm -hmm. I work eight to five, sometimes longer than that. And so it puts a huge burden on our families, and I know there's a, a, a person who's going to testify of what, what it's cost her in terms of her career and her family situation due to this exact issue. And I do know some folks, Laura, that pay a, a, somebody that they know from their church, pay someone else to say, could you take my child? They, they know that a six-year-old knows this person, mom knows this person, you take him to the, the day program at nine o'clock and pick him up at three. So, is that something that may work for you? So we've actually started looking at that. All of the programs for um, day programs are about 20 miles. Mm -hmm. So if we paid someone to do it, they're taking two hours out of their day every day to transport him. So we actually had a parent reach out to a company called All Points. All Points is this fabulous transportation company, and they have been providing care for our kids who are in the 18 to 21 program through the Blue Valley School District. They pick them up at our home, they take them to their life skills classes, they transport them to their jobs, and then they transport them home. The people have all been vetted in terms of background checks. They know our kids, we know them, and they have the same consistent caregiver or transportation person. Maybe not every single day, but we know on Tuesday it's gonna be Bob, and on Wednesday it's gonna be Julie, or whatever the names are. Um, we actually reached out to All Points to see if that would be a possibility. They won't do it because the re they don't, we don't cover their costs from a Medicaid perspective. So, Thank you so that's much. That's going to be our challenge. Thank you. And Commissioner, was there anything else that was addressed that you would like to speak to? Um, not at this time. She gave a very good uh, overview of how transportation okay, thank and day you. services work. And thank you very much. We're going to move to Dolores Kitchen. She's on WebEx. Dolores, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, great. So thank you for the opportunity to share my story and my husband's story. And thanks to Laura and the Kozacheks for their valuable information. I'm Dolores Kitchen. My husband and I have a 21-year-old son named John. John has Down syndrome, autism, ADHD, apraxia, and dyslexia. 
Johnny is sweet and he's a wickedly funny and hardworking young man. He's worked for two years cleaning at a local hair salon and currently works as a busboy at IHOP. He loves to work because it makes him feel independent. Because John has goals that at one day he wants to live independently in an apartment like his friends and work um, and, and work a, a fulfilling job and have a fulfilling life. When he was born, we lived in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm eligible for Missouri Medicaid and the autism waiver on that side of the state line. The waiver provided $3,200 to use for therapies and a separate uh, respite fund for us to use. The waiver paid for behavior therapy from um, certified behavior therapists, and they worked on um, John's safety, like propensity to run away in public, anxiety, and other things. Now, since John was born and knowing Missouri schools are ill-equipped Ill uh, Ill to teach him, we knew we would eventually need to move to Kansas to provide better education for him. And in 2015, we did that. We moved to Overland Park where John attended Prairie Star Middle School, graduated from Blue Valley High School, and just graduated from the post-secondary program, the 18 to 21 program. Once we moved, we immediately signed up for Medicaid and SSI, knowing that applying would place us on the wait list for the waiver. At that time, our case manager told us that the waiver um, would be at least five to, uh, five to seven years. John automatically received basic Medicaid when he turned 18, and we're grateful for that coverage. But John has been on the waiver wait list now for eight years, and um, we were initially told seven, and now we're being told that the wait list could be, he might not be accepted until he's well over 30. So now that John has graduated from post-secondary programming, he has no other support except for us, his parents. He doesn't have transportation or drive, job coaching, or other community support. I recently quit my job in corporate America to provide John with transportation and coordinate job exploration and training through different programs that have been mentioned previously. Leaving the workforce has caused our family to lose my salary, which was used to provide John with private job, job coaching, rather, <clears throat> and other resources the waiver provides. The resources, this is the keyword we've heard a few times. Um, there are not enough resources for our families like for families like mine and chil with children and adults with special needs. Many parents must leave the workforce to care for their children. As parents, we love our children and there's nothing we wouldn't do for them. But what about the parents and families as caregivers? I know several Kansas families where moms left careers when their children were born because their children would always need 24 hour specialized care. These moms and caregivers forego their own health care to care for their children. The pressure as a caregiver causes many of them to suffer mental health issues like depression. Moms and families also lose income from leaving the workforce because of the lack of resources to help families care for those loved ones. We need more resources for our families so our kids and families can continue to be productive. We don't have adequate resources and where we're putting those dollars needs to be reviewed to help our families and this population contribute to society. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Do we have questions for uh, Dolores today? Seeing none, Dolores, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you yes, to thank all you. of the conferees. Um, and committee, at this time, um, I want you to uh, take special note. We do have written only testimonies. Um, there are three of them in your packet and online. Um, oh. I'm sorry, those are from Michelle Hayden, and that was from the Bump Projects. And then we have Rick Elskamp, the private citizen, and then Molly Kennis. And uh, Commissioner, would you like to address that, the KDAD's Bump Projects that you gave us gave to us? In written only. So the FMAP project summary is just talking about how we how we are have spent and will spend the FMAP monies that we got um, from uh, uh, President Biden's ARPA rescue plan. Um, we have already spent approximately 53 million to give uh, direct support workers a bonus, either hiring bonus or a retention bonus, and that project has been completed. Um, that was 53 mil, 51 million actually. Um, we've worked, we've spent 28,000 on the sequential intercept model 
um, to develop that, and that's to help prevent keeping people with IDD out of the um, justice system, to look at different points at where we can stop them from going into, going in, getting in trouble and getting into jail. Projects in process right now are the workforce training, um, and we, we are spending up to approximately two million for that. Um, we are going to be submitting an RFP for that. Um, IDD and PD waitlist study. You already heard Dr. E Dr. Um, Evan Dean talk about that. We have launched an IDD TCM study um, with a public consulting group looking at the best ways to keep uh, TCM going and what we need to do about it. Um, let's see. Autism behavior training. Um, we have allocated 333,000, and DCF will be running that contract to look at helping uh, families with children with autism. Um, the projects that still need approval from CMS are workforce training and career ladder. Um, we have five million dollars allocated for that. Employment first. Um, we have almost two million allocated for that, um, awaiting announcement for contract approval. I will say that we've had great um, input on the employment first. We have people coming from education, commerce, everywhere to work together to make uh, Kansas truly an employment first state. Um, expansion of employment first network providers. We have 1.5 million uh, set aside for that. Um, we have remodeling grants of five million that we're looking for for help in coming into compliance with the final rule. Uh, we have technology first that we are looking to fund, um, putting technology in the hands of members to increase independence, socialization, social determinants of health, smart home technology. We have three million for that. Um, to provide grants to providers to implement smart home technology for members in support and increase in independence, socialization, and social determinants of health, community support waiver. Um, we have um, <clears throat> money in there, $2 million to go to providers to develop the services on the community support waiver. <clears throat> and number nine, PACE expansion. Um, we are looking to pro, uh, expand PACE programs into rural parts of the state. Um, and we did talk earlier about the, uh, the uh, IDD tier rate assessment, looking at um, how we're going to, uh, to reimburse providers um, and do that study with the biennial requirement. We have a one-time payment of 500000 to SAC, the Self-Advocacy Coalition for Kansas, so that they can um, provide additional staffing, transportation to events, um, so that their voices are heard as we develop our programs. Additional staffing for, for KDADS. Um, this will be for to request um, FMAP staff to oversee smart home technology first and remodeling grants two community supports waiver staff two pay staff two staff in our fiscal department and one program staff um, there will also be staff training and conferences and travel um, to confer with other states to learn about best practices and we also are proposing a specialized medical care grant for our technology technology assisted waiver of five million um, to provide all necessary staffing and supports necessary to promote successful transition from hospital and prevent readmission and these are for medically fragile children that are on uh, different kinds of technology in order to live such as vents um, g tubes etc so altogether um, we have about 102 million, 885,000. Commissioner, before I open up for questions for the rest of the committee, um, it says under the community support waiver, project waiting approval from CMS, but we haven't even submitted an application yet, correct? 
Right, that what we're waiting for approval on is actually to use funds to develop a community support waiver, not even, I'm not, we're not even at the point where we're working on submitting the waiver yet. I see, and right. the RFP would be? A request for proposal. Right, but I mean, from whom are we requesting that we're using the two million? It's a, we're asking. It would, we would put it out to uh, give uh, potentially grants to different providers. We could divide that two million up to develop certain services that are on the community support waiver that we don't currently already have in the, um, in the field right now. Hmm. And what services would those be? Because I thought we already offered them. It's just we had people in a waiting list for them. Um, some of those, they, they're, there's some that look a little different. There's, we're, we have a push to uh, have an S assistive technology service on the community support waiver. We're looking at potentially having budget authority for folks. So they would need um, people, benefit specialists to help them manage that. Um, there is ABA therapies we're looking at, uh, advanced uh, behavioral uh, services for that. So there are a number of different service models that we're looking at that we, we still have the primary ones which people want and that's personal care attendant service and supported employment. So actually the community support waiver would expand services more than what we have now. Uh, yes, it would it would add some other services. Add some other services. All right, committee, do you have questions? Yes, Senator Petty. Um, Michelle, thank you so much. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, we did have this um, uh, written only testimony um, from from a Rick Elskamp, and um, one of the things that he uh, brings up in here is about the CDDOs and, and they're working with services in the community. Um, it, it seems in that it's dealing with their, he's a parent of a 22 year old mm -hmm. um, development and disabled daughter. Um, they're not able to get their day services that they, um, well, she has day services, but she's a self pay client as of 2022 when she uh, aged out. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just go, could you just kind of spell out for us that process of why she would end up being a self-pay and, and why, I mean, I can see that there's always going to be um, not happiness about how the CDDOs uh, work with a client sometimes, but then how, just the process of how they go through that with a CDDO. In this case, it's in, it doesn't really matter where it's in our state, but this one is in Shawnee County. Sure, so I can't speak to his case. Uh, sure, not exactly, but just going through right. the process. So as, because we have a waiting list, you know, people go onto the waiting list and when they, um, Need, have a need for service, and so all of those people have a need for a service. The only way they're entering now is if we either spend more money on the waiver or people fall off the waiver and we have an offer round. Um, and so unless she's at a crisis in her life, then we can't fund her at this time. And that's, that's the case for many people that do need certain services, but we don't have funding to go along with it. Um, so that's where, um, um, you know, the waiting list comes in and where we, you know, unfortunately cannot serve everybody at the time that they, they feel that they need services. So what exactly would she or any other client be getting through the case manager when they're on the waiting list? So a case manager would also be looking for, you know, other alternative resources. Um, waiver services are pretty unique and you don't find them in a lot of other places. Um, and so Medicaid is pretty much uh, the only, only game in town for a number of services. Um, but however, I mean, they'll look and see if there's other kind of programs that might um, meet her need. And my guess is not knowing this case specifically is they haven't found something um, that will uh, be akin to a day service and that's is what I'm understanding that they're looking for in this case. 
And so they appeared, in this case, they appear to have day service, but they're having to pay for the day service. Correct. Uh, some families are fortunate enough they have some money to do that. Most do not, um, but some, some do. And I know that's not how they plan to use that money, but they're a little bit ahead of the game as far as some of the other families that cannot even af afford that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Billinger. Thank you, Madam Chairman. These FMAF funds, funds do they have uh, restrictions on how they can be used? Yes. Um, so during the uh, public health emergency, the Biden administration uh, gave us increase of 10% of federal funds. So the 10% that we would have normally used to uh, provide these waiver services, we can then use um, to provide, um, promote projects that um, align with HCBS or PACE, Home and Community-Based Services. Thus, we have done these programs, such as the um, waitlist study, the uh, Reimbursement, reimbursements to providers for um, bonuses, hiring and retention, all of the programs that I've, I've noted down here. Could, could we use those funds to uh, accelerate this community support? Um, the one gentleman that talked there earlier said, you know, we could do it with state general funds. Can we use these FMAP funds to do this? I, I'd like to see this sooner rather than later. I, I, I just can't hardly sit here when you say 2026. I mean, it's like, come on, we can do better. Mm -hmm. We need to do better. I think we need to figure this out. Just like the lady you just talked that has a son at home. There's probably some services in here that might help him. Maybe it's a transportation piece, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And uh, Interhab mentioned earlier that 85% of these people do not need the full ball of wax. They just need particular services. Well, I think we could go a long, long ways if we just, let's get started. Let's get the moving on this. And, and if and we have these monies, w would that impede us from getting CMS approval down the road? Or would it help? No. I mean, if Missouri's already had it, it would seem to me like, let's don't reinvent the wheel. Let's take theirs and... Get, get this application in. Correct. So right now we do not, you know, we ha we're asking for the staff to build this waiver with KDADs and stakeholders. We don't have that staff right now. We also do not have funds to distribute to waiver to uh, providers to help them build the services. We will move as quickly as possible once approved by CMS to get this in place. I, the estimates for the longevity, how long it's going to take, are just based on our personal experience with CMS that um, when you build a waiver, it usually takes 18 months to two years to do that. Well, it seems to me like I wasn't on this last year, but it was on it the prior two years, and, and we've been talking about it for six, seven years. I mean, and here we are. We're still two years away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's just unacceptable. I mean, uh, we got to do better. I mean, it, it seems like we're, we just dropped the ball. We have these meetings and then everybody goes home and it's just like, well, we'll talk, it about, uh, talk about it again next year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if there's funds there that can be used for this, I'd like to get this program started. Make a difference in a lot of lives. Um, you know, we can discuss that, but we wouldn't have federal funds to go with it. We would just be able to use these funds for a waiver, just this, whatever the state funds we have available, and that would not serve near as many people. But well, we could start. Well, I think, look at your list there. I think your one program you're giving $53 million to. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could keep $5 million of that for the IDD, get this thing going. We already spent that $51 million for, uh, for, for caregiver bonuses. So, so we've had this meeting way too late. Should have had this thing months ago when we had funds available. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the, the bonuses were approved. That was something that was part of the, the uh, recommendations. Um, and now we're, but I share the frustrations of Senator Billinger. Senator Fack. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, 
Thank you, Commissioner. I got a question and a follow-up to it, too, okay. if, if you may. First thing that uh, crossed my mind was uh, you, you mentioned about promoting the programs. How do, how do you promote uh, through the process? When you let the word out, is there funding that you put into advertising somewhere that tries to promote? Anytime I hear the word promote, I like to know how are we promoting? Because that, that can be some money. So I, um, I, I don't think we have specific funds to promote the program. We have funds. No, when you listed through your stuff, didn't you mention promote in there somewhere? Let me see. Okay. I don't think we did. If we didn't, we did not. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not sure All right, what you were then, referring then to. I'll take that back. Okay. <clears throat> My second question then would be, how do you review the effectiveness? Well, this is a lot of money. How do we review after we spend the money to know if it was effective or not? So we have quarterly reporting that we have to do to CMS on this, and they have reports, and I don't have those with me, that we have to uh, show what we did with the money and how effective that might be, and I'm not the expert on that. Is that but a real... Uh, detailed report, or is that something I'd be interested in seeing something like that? I can get that for you. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really familiar I, that, with it. This amount right of money now. says we need to know <clears throat> are we doing the right thing mm -hmm. and, and why did we spend that money? So, thank you. Um, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up on Senator Billinger's point. How much uh, flexibility do you have, like for like individual budget budget authority? It seems like we've heard that here today. Uh, I mean, is that we have to go to CMS to do that, or can we do that here in Kansas? Um, we have self direction. We don't have individual budget authority. That has to be written into a waiver. But some states do do that, and we're looking at doing that on the community support waiver where a person would get a, an X amount of money that they can spend on services that month for them, and they work with a, a benefit specialist to um, develop those services. Let's say that they say PCS is the most important, personal care services is the most important, and they want to pay that person $20 an hour. They can use more of their budget for that and pay that higher rate. But they could solve their, their transportation problem, too. They could way. do that, too. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Piggyback on what Senator Billinger said, uh, believe me, it's been a, I'm not a very patient person, and this has really challenged my patience when it comes to these kind of things. But there are just a certain amount of things. We have to get in a row before we do this to do it right. But the other thing is, correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, there's no limit for us to expand the people that are on the waiver now. Is that right, except for money? Correct. So, oh, well, money and a provider network. Right. Yeah. Absent the provider network, which we know is struggling. But mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that we could expand with, uh, well, I figured it out there a couple of years ago, it was $20 million a year. We could, you know, take... Uh, 500 people or whatever off the wait list every year. So there are no limitations on the large waiver. It, will that serve people well? Um, maybe not. But anyway, th just to, there are, is no limitations for the current waiver except money. Correct. Senator Petty. Uh, this kind of follows up on <clears throat> the question from uh, Representative Clifford, so, I, I mean, I'm seeing these ads on TV about utilized paid family caregivers, and um, so, but that would take, I mean, and this is talked about before, about paying family caregivers, um, but that would take, would that take a another waiver? Actually, we've, um, uh, we, we're getting ready to submit our amendments to CMS to allow for paid family caregivers outside of the measures during the pandemic, which we allowed during that time. Um, and uh, CMS has agreed to work with us to make sure they're in, pl in place by the time that Appendix K runs out so families can continue to be paid to provide supports to their loved ones. Thank you. 
And committee, I told you that I uh, have been texting back and forth with Kurt Matthews from Missouri, who's the deputy director of Medicaid there. He did get back to me on some of my questions. Okay. Um, one question that I had was, you had mentioned more of an aggregate because we have MCOs, we can do more of an uh, aggregate cap. Mm -hmm. For those who don't understand what that means, if we had 40, say we have 40 people, and these 40 people, maybe half of them, 20 of them, only used $10,000 worth of services. But three people hit their cap of 20000 They could still be serviced because the aggregate overall cap was not met for these 40 people. Correct. We would have the ability to do that because we have MCOs. And he said they don't do that in Missouri. It's per person cap. So if one person meets their cap, which is why he didn't have the exact number of people that met the 28000 But they requested 40000 for their cap because of the fact this was in July of 2021 mm -hmm. because they had a couple of people that they thought, well, we need we need to increase that cap because we have a couple of people we don't want to end their services. Mm -hmm. We, however, the 20,000 would make more sense for us since it would be an aggregate cap. So I thought that I would mention that. The other thing, there was there was mention about Medicaid expansion and just to confirm, he, he also confirmed Medicaid expansion dollars can never be used for the IDD community. It's only for the Medicaid expansion population. So at this point, thank you so much, yep. um, Michelle. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to be looking at our recommendations. And uh, I'm going to open that up. Some of you may have written recommendations we may need to discuss. But let's begin. Who wants to start with their first recommendation? OK, Senator Petty. Well, um, we received today in testimony from Matt five points. And so I thought that those were important points. If I can just find them again. While you're looking um, for those points, I'm, I'm just going to start with the obvious, which is the community support waiver. Are we all in favor of that idea? And having that as be one of our recommendations this, at this committee recommends they move forward uh, with getting that uh, permission from CMS. Can I ask a question about that? Of course. That? Um, aren't we already moving forward? Do we want, is it our position that we want to continue with the process, the place? Because it's not. It's already in place. It is already in place. It's just us saying, yes, we, we think that's a good idea. And that's one of the reasons it was brought to us, was we had requested it, I think, last year about the community support waiver. By the way, Missouri has titled theirs that exact same thing, community support waiver. And they said that they would be happy to work with Kansas, the steps that they went through to try to help us expedite um, that process, if we could use their same model, and we could say to CMS, this is basically the one you approved in Missouri, so I hope that you'll give us faster approval. And Senator Petty, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, Thank go you, ahead. Madam Chair. So um, the um, five recommendations that um, were laid out by Matt Fletcher, the Executive Director of AIRHAB, were to um, the review uh, well, I don't. Do you want me to read them because they are on page three, two of his testimony? The re review some should incorporate appropriate inflationary index as part of its examination of service costs. Um, all service-related costs should be examined. All five elements for review that are included in statute must be adjusted based on inflationary data, and the review. Um, must include an examination of all services when the IDD system, not just those delivered via the uh, HCBS IDD waiver. And uh, the review should recommend at a minimum inflationary increase experience during the previous fiscal year. He also mentioned that we should be looking at this every, that we should be looking at our recommendation for um, an index every two years, which we haven't done. And that is in statute, I believe. However, we haven't been doing it. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So I, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything and that. Um, 
It so is in statutes. It's been in statutes since uh, was it ninety five, mm -hmm. um, and it definitely uh, as we're uh, this uh, interim committee, uh, it seems relevant that we should be recommending that we be following the statute. Totally agree. Uh, committee, are we all in favor of these proposals uh, that were just brought up from Senator Petty? Okay. Uh, other proposals? Just, just, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to add on to that, um, these studies, I, I don't know, uh, who knows how much they cost. They cost like a ha half a million dollars. Uh, uh, a year to to do these studies, which I'm not against. I'm just saying, we do one uh, r really similar to what I envision for the nursing homes, the three year rebasing, figuring actual costs, and you drop one year off and figure the next one. Uh, it seems like, you know, maybe not reinventing the wheel by piggybacking on that. That also is in statute, and. Uh, but, you know, as legislators, uh, sometimes we ignore statutes. The nursing home rebasing has been, the last two years has been the only years that it's been officially done the way it was supposed to do, the, the entire rebasing process. So when we say this, we need to also keep our feet to the fire to make damn sure that it gets done. And so your proposal would be? Specifically, how would you the want that? Yeah, to, to, to mirror it off the nursing home reimbursement um, of three-year running average. So currently it's to be two years that they reject the rates, that they do a rate review for IDD. That's true. But we never exactly. So I, I think it goes back to what Senator Petty said, that we need to make sure that that is done every two years. Committee, other proposals? Oh, Representative Ballard. Can you hear me, Representative Ballard? Oh, she's unmuted. We're going to go ahead with Representative Haswood, and then we'll come back when we can hear Representative Ballard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a quick question in your committee, and I know Representative Ballard's are ranking on the House side. Um, do you guys get that that figure that uh, KDADS needs for the IDD waitlist, that magic number that I've been looking for all day? <laughs> are you referring to that 4,800 number? I guess just... Um, because this issue has been underfunded for two decades, and it sounds like in the most current years we finally put in that financial investment. Um, do you guys in your committee during the session get that financial report more in depth? Well, that's a good question. Our committees don't line up with your committees, and so it would probably all come to my committee, mm -hmm. which would be the Health and Human Services Committee. Mm -hmm. And we get lots of things, but most of the budget issues like that go to the budget committee. Okay. So it's kind of different on our side of the aisle. Okay. So, and Representative Billinger is with the budget committee, so I could ask him that question. He's the chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know right off the top uh, what them numbers are, but yes, we do get them. Okay, um, and then I don't know if it's been uh, mentioned, but it sounds like the more flexibility of choices of services um, needs to be uh, implemented as well. Thank you. And that's the IBA, and I had that in my notes as well. So the IBA proposal would be something we want them to take a look at as to how we could do that. I would agree. Thank you. And is Representative Ballard on the line yet? Not yet. Okay, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really think we ought to press the administration to enhance the ability to have individual budget authority. I don't know if it's capacity building on the financial mm -hmm. management services side or just putting that out there. I, I mean, we have 13 services plus target, target, targeted case management. I think if the 
control was in the hand of, hand of the families, even people on the robust waiver, they would prioritize which of those services they need. They might not need, uh, you know, wellness monitoring. Totally agree uh, with so. you. And that was the proposal that was just recommended by Representative Haswood. Thank you. I agree. I, I second that. He Christina. seconds that. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're, we're asking for them to look into the IBA as to how that could be added. Uh, other proposals, committee? Seeing none, um, we'll check one last check to see Representative Ballard is available. She left the meeting. Okay. She yes, she was having issues. We were having difficulty hearing her, um, et cetera. So that's understandable. That was going to be my next point. So thank you so much. So Dayton, yes, yes. Representative just, Carpenter. Just for a quick clarification. So we already have amendments, Michelle. Um, so we already have amendments to the waiver under the changing it to the 1915 C. Is that one of them, the self-direction? Because so, most of these have to be, the one that you're proposing has to be okayed by CMS. Yeah, it, it's not part, the, the the budget authority, we don't have an, an amendment pending for that currently. We're looking at that for the community support waiver to allow that as a, as a potential model within that waiver. But you could add that to an amendment to our waiver now, except for it expires next July. Um, we are in the process of working with stakeholders to develop that waiver for next July, and that's certainly something we can look at for that. Um, we're already meeting with stakeholders. I can check with my team to see if that's something that's being brought up in those those uh, those meetings right now. Okay, very good. So we can work on that throughout that process, either in our new waiver or ahead of time. Senator Petty. Um, I'm not sure that I, I'm, I'm not bringing this up. I'm not sure that I necessarily want to make this as a recommendation, but it had come up in our in questioning as we listened to um, presenters today, and that was the fact, and I think actually um, Senator Billinger um, brought it up at least once about um, we have the ability or we could have the ability to look at putting state dollars in um, so that wouldn't we would not have to wait until 2026 uh, to begin the community-based um, services. Um, so I'm opening that up as a, whether we want to make that as a recommendation. Committee, is there discussion about making that as a recommendation? I would I would just venture to say we've always known we can do things with state dollars. It's just much better if we could have 60% of it paid by federal dollars. And yes, we don't want to wait, um, but I would personally like to see us pursue Missouri helping us to try to expedite that. I, I also have a request that's not part of our recommendations, but uh, Commissioner Michelle, that if you could um, make a presentation to the, my Senate committee, our Senate Health and Human Services Committee, as to an update as to how things are proceeding uh, with working on this waiver. We all want it to be yesterday. So just as soon as possible. And I know there are certain steps that you have to take. Um, but if any, if, you know, again, if our Missouri folks can help you, they've been through it. They have the same waiver um, that just kind of let us know how that's working. I know you know the folks over there, but if there's any introductions I could make that could help, let me know. Um, okay, Dayton, if you could please read your statement. Uh, very. Uh loose recommendations that I've jotted down. Uh, so let me know if I've got the gist of it. First, uh, you recommend that KDOT's biannual rate study satisfy the following. First, that it, uh, the review should incorporate appropriate inflationary indexes as part of its examination of service costs. All service-related costs should be examined. All five elements listed in the statute uh, for review 
that are uh, must be adjusted based on infl inflationary data. The review must include an examination of all services within the IDD system, not just those delivered via the waiver. The review should recommend at a minimum inflationary increases experienced during the previous fiscal year. Is that your intent for that one? It is. Could you read okay. again what you had at the beginning date and about uh, um, community support waiver? Um, we're just saying yes, we approve. Would like for them to go ahead as quickly as possible. I haven't got to the community support waiver okay. one. This was just the one based on interhabs. Yes, and that yes, that's fine. So that's directly off the testimony. Right. The next one uh, is to review um, rates in the biannual rate study utilizing actual cost data. Mm -hmm. The next one is to uh, continue developing the community support waiver um, as fast as possible. Post haste. Yes. Yes. Okay. Something to that extent. Uh, the next one that KDADS should include individual budget authority in its renewal application for the existing comprehensive waiver. And I think that you said you could not do that. Is that right? As far as the amendment to the current comprehensive waiver, you couldn't add the IBA. We'd have to do that with the community support waiver. Did I misunderstand? When you say IBA, what, what, what do you mean? The Independent Budget Authority. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Um, we, we have we so many acronyms. We could include it in our renewal that we're working on now, um, but we, I'd have to go back to the team to see if that's been brought up, and if not, we'd have to look at that and look at costs and whether we would be funded to do that. Okay. But we then we would still recommend that you do look at that. That would be part of our recommendation. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yes, if we could word it that way. Sure, we'll explore including in the <laughs> renewal. And then the final recommendation uh, was, I'm not sure if this was a recommendation, to explore funding a state community support program to proceed CMS approval for the community support waiver. I'm not sure if there was agreement on that one, but that was the last recommendation I had listed. Um, so how did you state that again? Uh, to explore funding a, a state funded community support program to proceed the CMS approval, Senator Petty's uh, final. Yes, I, I just want us to be careful about how we're making a recommendation about that. I think if we were to say, and I'll, I'll open this up for discussion among the committee, but if we were to say, take a look at it, we're not saying we recommend the state fund this, because I don't think we're ready to do that. So looking at it, I, I have no problem with that. Maybe they can even get back to us on how much that would cost, how many people they think they could help. You know, that sort of thing. Is that, are you in agreement, Senator Petty? Uh, yes, I think that, of course, uh, I think actually Representative Carpenter used a, actually, actually a fiscal number that 20 million? Is that what you said? Annually. Uh, annually. Um, so um, there, there, and was that reviewed last year, Representative Carpenter? I don't, uh, I wasn't on this couple last years year. Ago. It's ongoing, yeah, a couple years. Mm -hmm. and, and so that would be like 250 million all funds or so, more. We're talking about state dollars, the 20. Yeah, that'd it? be 20 million 20. a year basically, but you know, you extrapolate out 60, 40, so all funds it's going to be. But would there actually be any federal funds? Because we're talking about this would be expansion and doing it before we have a federal approval, so there wouldn't be any federal dollars involved. So there would just be, be state dollars. Three hundred million to to do away with the wait list. Uh, that's not what I had said, though. I didn't say do away with the wait list. I mean, I'm just going back to you. Twenty million dollars was what you had used that number. Um, that <clears throat> I think the confusion is Senator Petty yeah. that the twenty million was was with are just the state funds, not covering the whole thing. That would just be if we had tw we only had to pay 20 million and then plus the federal dollars to be able to Right, and this would not be federal people. dollars because this exactly. would be pre- Exactly, it would not. It would be uh, pre-approval uh, of the waiver. So there would be so very little my recommendation, my, my thought is just exactly what was said, is that, could you restate that? The last remark. Uh, to explore funding a state community support program to proceed CMS approval for the community support waiver. Yes, that's, that's what I was saying. 
Committee, are we in agreement with that proposal? Yes, uh, Re Senator Billinger. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to say we would look for funding. I don't think we want to dedicate state funds, but I, I was asking about the FMAP funding, whether or not there was funds there that would be available that we could go ahead and use for this to get the program started. That's what my question was. Senator Petty, are you in agreement to changing your recommendation to look for funding that we could maybe FMAP map funding, et cetera, that we could go ahead and get started to put some and take some of these people off before we have the the community support waiver? I think it's the same, although I'm not an expert on FMAP, but I'm certain we can't use FMAP so for this. So it would be state dollars. I mean, we'd be looking. We didn't say, did that say, we're looking for a way to fund, to fund community support services prior to the um, CMS approval. On this, on the community support waiver. Right. So. I think we would all be in agreement to that, would we not? Okay, thank you. And I think next I have uh, Senator Fagg. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I. I think I'm along the same track. I, my question was to the commissioner, do we endanger any of uh, the funding of the new waiver if we go in and use state funding ahead of time and then you know, go into this and then they look back and say, we well, already have it. That, that, and she's already. I, I didn't want to take a chance of us funding this thing and then blowing this thing up with CMS on Well, and just, just to clarify, um, Senator Fagg, state dollars alone would be, would fund very little. Um, the reason is like, as was mentioned yeah. from um, Representative Carpenter, the 20 million state funds is gonna be matched with a very large portion from the federal. But what we're trying to find out is, do we have um, dollars that could potentially be available now that might be used for that purpose to get started on um, getting people off of the waiting list now while we're waiting for the community support waiver. Okay. Do you agree with that, Commissioner? Actually, that would be difficult to do because FMAP dollars are for one time only. They are not continuous funds. So if we took let's say 100 people off of the waiting list, we cannot use the FMAP dollars to do that because they are one-time only funds. That answers that question. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. uh, Representative Clifford. Yes, uh, I didn't want to narrow this discussion too much, but uh, as a physician, I get uh, families in and caregivers with the form where I sign for the transportation reimbursement. And I don't, I'm not sure whose rule it is that says that's only for medical care. And again, what we've heard consistently today is that parents are being forced to retire early to provide transportation. Folks can't have support employment because they can't get there. They can't get the job training. They can't get to school. So I, I would like to see, I mean, I sit on social services budget uh, with Will and, and, and uh, Representative Mason. Um, I would like to hear the administration come forward with just a simple transportation number. Uh, could we provide 10 million or whatever it is for both people on the waiting list and uh, who are already in the waiver um, to solve some of these problems? I, I think if we enable families, they're gonna come up with solutions. I don't think we have to impose or create the solution. So to me, I, I keep hearing transportation, transportation, you can't put them on the bus. I'd like to see them come forward to us next session with an ask to provide that funding. So we were told it's for medical purposes that they can get transportation for medical services. And what I hear you saying, it would be for additional services um, for those who are on the waiting list to still go ahead and have transportation, even it's to a service for which they would have to pay out of pocket. If that's the impediment, I think we should fund it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, and so committee, are you in favor of having them look at how much that would cost um, to provide transportation only for some of these services for people who are on the waiting list? Yes, thank you. 
Yes, Rep. Uh, Senator Fagg. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This kind of fits into this conversation. I know uh, Representative Carpenter has been a county commissioner. Is this something that we could maybe offer some kind of matching fund and get the counties involved with this kind of thing? I'm just, uh, just a thought because they do transportation now and have it on the local area, and then we wouldn't have to fund the whole thing. We would incent this thing a good thing to happen. Just a thought. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I appreciate that. Um, after last year's meeting, we heard transportation like that was the big thing. And we do have some very successful areas that have great transportation program. Salina has a very good program for that. Not just Salina, but the counties surrounding that. There's one I was just talking to someone earlier. And Lawrence has a very good one. Um, so in that hierarchy, my thinking was that we have 27 CDDOs. And so you, you have to have somebody in charge of it so that you can say you're doing a crappy job or, you know, has to be responsible. But I do think that we should look at tasking. And I, again, it's going to be money involved, you know, because those, those vans are 50 grand a piece used, you know, but I do think that there is some inroads we can make in the transportation deal of having 2070 MCO or CDDOs running a transportation program. We heard so much about that uh, last year, and I hear about it all the time. And, you know, if, if these folks are going to get a job, they have to have a reliable person. You can't say, well, my transportation just didn't show up today, so I can't go to work. So it's just an integral part of this whole process of employment first and all that. Now, I think there's uh, some really good merit to that, and I appreciate you bringing so that up. One, so the recommendation, uh, how would you word that? Representative Clifford. Uh, to uh, consider uh, options to provide transportation for uh, individuals on both the waiver and the waiting list. That's non-medical, correct? Correct. It's not medical. And, and I would add, Madam Chair, uh, again, I am a former county commissioner. Uh, county commissioners have a little appetite for increased risk, putting people in vans, running transportation services at times. But families can call Uber. So I'm for getting in the hands of the folks who care the most. And I don't think you have to have an insurable van run by the county at great expense if you enable the families to just get reimbursed. Senator Petty. Um, and I think everything that we've heard is great ideas, but I do believe that there has to be a, a system to work through, and I do think our CDDOs are the ones to be working through with the transportation funding, because your families have to work for them, go through them to be on a waiting list as it is. And, and I Senator appreciate Clifford. that. I, I, my good friend Mark Hind is, runs the CDDO in Finney County. I will ask him, do they have an appetite for running the transportation piece? Uh, uh, you're right. That that structure already exists. So I, I understand the appeal of doing that. I, I don't know if they have an interest. So I'm I'm not saying that they have to run the run the system, but they have to be the conduit that the fun funding comes through. So Commissioner, sorry to ask you to come back to the microphone again, Michelle. Is that recommendation clear as to what we're asking? You're asking about uh, providing funds to people on the waiting list and on the waiver for non-medical transportation. Yes, ma'am, that's and it. And you want to get an estimate on that? Uh, yes, okay. an estimate on cost. Great, right. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We will add that to our recommendations then. So just yes. to clarify, so are we talking about- Let me about just say Representative Bueller for the purposes of the mic of the uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Video. So just, just for purposes of clarity, are we talking about both um, reimbursement and a system of transportation? Are they mutually exclusive? So I'm, I'm just trying to, or, or is the consideration for both? I wouldn't think they're mutually exclusive. And that it would seem there could be some reimbursement 
for you know private transportation as well as what's provided. So the header is transportation. The subparts are um, reimbursement or some system of transportation. That's the way I would understand it, Representative Clifford. Madam Chair, I would, I would uh, absolutely agree. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Other recommendations, committee? Yes, Representative Carpenter. So I need to cut in here and back up just a little bit. I'm texting with uh, Representative Ballard is actually having some oh, okay. problems with, with her audio and it's cut out a couple of times. So I, I wanted to start um, just so, and these are questions that she wanted to ask, how much to totally eliminate the wait list that, that uh, and uh, and I think to back up, we if we had the community support waiver, um, a lot of those people could come off the wait list. So as far as how much does it cost to get people off the list, would be we would provide comprehensive services for everyone, um, which now we're looking at. That's not really necessary. Maybe we could do like what Missouri did with the community support waiver and get people off that way without necessarily having a comprehensive waiver. So those are two different cost estimates. Yes. I think we would always have a, a comprehensive waiver, but we would also have... Much lo much smaller waiting so list. I'm just asking these questions yes. for her. So, um, And then uh, I had said it was around 120 million. That's an obsolete number compared to today. Can the state afford it? Good question. Okay, lost audio again. Can we increase services for caregivers if we can't decrease the wait list? Uh, so then uh, lost total connection. <laughs> Please let me know if we're in a meeting on Tuesday. We'll have computer services. <laughs> She's a two-hour time difference. Oh, so okay. anyway, uh, those are her questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so Commissioner Michelle, did you have any answers for that or was what I said suffice? You want to go over that one more time, just so I'm clear? Uh, yes. The questions again were. Yeah. The the first one was uh, constituent wanted to know um, the wait list cost. That's fairly accurate. I mean, what I'd said, 120 20 million a year is what. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. And then, of course, that's all. All funds would be 60 more percent of that. Okay. Correct. And then the other one is, um, can we increase services for caregivers if we can't de decrease the wait list? You mean put put more funds into the rates for, for caregivers? We can choose to do that. We can choose to fund the wait list. We could choose to do neither or, or both. Um, it, it's, it's up to what the legislature wants to do there. And I believe we did do that this past year. We, you we did. did the you bonuses. did give a 25% increase. We did the 25% increase plus Correct. the bonuses. Correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, committee, do we have any other recommendations or questions? Thank you very much, and thank you to the conferees today. And um, Dayton, you will get that list out for us. And then that, at the next meeting, we will expect a... Um, answer, and I hope that you can get the answers earlier. I'm sorry? No, but I, I'm sure that she will be making a presentation to the the health committee on, on for the Senate and the health committee on the, on the representative side. Yes, Senator Petty. Uh, now that we've had some more discussion, could Dayton go over his complete list? Of course. Dayton, would you do that? Sure. Um, the first one was the Interhab's five recommendations, which I'll transcribe exactly. Um, the second one was to review, the, during that annual rate study, biannual rate study, to review the rates utilizing actual costs. Next, to uh, continue with the process for developing the community support waiver as quickly as possible. Uh, to consider including individual budget authority and its renewal application for the existing comprehensive waiver to explore the creation of a community support program to proceed CMS approval for the community support waiver. And uh, finally, to explore options to provide non-medical transportation for individuals on the waiver and waiting list. 
including um, exploring reimbursement or development of a transportation system and to provide a cost estimate of such options. That's what I had. That sounds good. Um, committee, again, any other questions? Thank you for your hard work today, and we are adjourned.